learnings. Uh, a huge also thank you to our incredible team, our chapter leads, Dr. Du Shishkov, who owns his own architecture interior design studio in Sofia, and Alejandro Garcia Gadea, who is a lead creative uh, design architect at uh, DAR Al Handasan in Dubai. And uh, had numerous, uh, they had numerous creative con design conversations with the students and also taught them multiple, uh, many of unique uh, workflows between polygonal modeling uh, with Maya, Rhino, Grasshopper. Uh, so they've been really key players in this uh, chapter. Uh, we also have uh, with us our core leads uh, that are leading groups A and B, Eva Hefes and Tung Engen, who have been amazing and always uh, so supportive. Our technical lead, Pedro Venegas Rodriguez, who also supported uh, with uh, Media Lab uh, tips and tricks and uh, knowledge, and also our Media Lab leads, uh, Michael Ku and Jordan Zarev, um, who were teaching the students rendering and post-production in this chapter. And of course, my peers, Svetlana Georgiev and Michael Pryor. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Uh, also, I would like to introduce our new guests today. Uh, we're so thankful for your support. We have um, with us today Ariane Hakimi, founder and principal of Ariane Hakimi Architects, uh, Eric Goldenberg, co-founder of Monat Studio, Krista Gabriel or Sunshine, who is the head of community of Wilder World, uh, Justin Melillo, who is the founder and CEO of Monoverse, Marius Ciliakos, associate partner at uh, Foster and Partners Applied Research and Development Group, uh, and Liliana Hughes, who is a product manager at Entopology, and George Samir, head of creative design at Dar Alejandro Hassan from Dubai. So thank you all for joining us today. We have also some uh, returning guests, um, like the Oleg that I spotted earlier, but we might have like some uh, more people like joining us uh, sporadically throughout the presentation. Um, yeah, so I would like to say just a couple of words about the program uh, and just like to give you a little bit like of a glimpse of like what this chapter two is. So I would like to say a couple of words and basically this program pushes the boundaries of design and transcends through multiple scales and challenges while advancing immensely the students design and software capabilities. And it's all organized in five leading design chapters and five supporting technical and theoretical labs that span over a nine month period. The second chapter that we'll be reviewing today, um, it's um, uh, revolving around habitats uh, that the body it's, uh, uh, the, the body develops around it. Uh, so during this uh, first stage of the program and uh, the body basically requires and demands these habitats. So during this period, the students have to answer questions regarding what kind of residence such a body uh, calls for and how technological enhancements will, will affect the already built, the already built ones and transform them. And this will also lead us to a better understanding of how the body we currently have and operate on creates a space around us and how it limits um, and, and limits uh, produce uh, and uh, the produced forms uh, we have and um, bypass them. Using the theoretical frame already developed in the first stages uh, of the program, um, the students have to design and produce this space uh, that will cover the body's uh, housing needs and will uh, also act as a starting point and a sale for the future city's development. So for what we're going to see in chapter Three, it's basically amalgam uh, what we call amalgamation. So it's basically like working with multitudes of aggregations of these cells and how they create like the future cities. So this is just the, the first cell uh, of uh, this um, future city that it's very much um, in tune and very much um, uh, in with the same logics that the, the body is created in chapter one. And some important points so just uh, that you need to have in mind uh, for this review are that this is not an architectural masters, but it's a program focused on envisioning the future of humanity. Uh, we're reviewing a habitat level design uh, for the students um, have uh, previous chapters that they have developed, uh, chapter one, that they're going to show like a glimpse of their work from this chapter. 
and we'll be looking at one unit, which, as I mentioned, is a part of a bigger design aggregation in the next chapter. So uh, it's going to, we're looking at also like connectivity and how the cells will aggregate um, in the future is also vital. Uh, we'll be reviewing a total of 14 projects today. So presentation should be contained within seven minutes for reviews and around uh, five to seven minutes uh, for um, uh, uh, seven minutes for presentations and seven minutes for reviews uh, for each presentation. And Evan Tung will be helping us uh, keeping time. So without further ado, I'll hand over to the first team. All right, uh, okay. Hi, Prasad. Hello, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, okay. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Prasad and I welcome you all to Nidos, the Nidroid Haven. What's a Nidroid, you ask? Well, it all started in the year 2222. Vast amounts of land had been reclaimed by the oceans. People left their cities in search of refuge. Political tensions were at an all-time high, with wars resulting in a permanent nuclear winter. Radiation levels peaked. The only survivors of this catastrophe were the Aquanauts, Captain Spectre, and his diverse crew of 300. They lived in a habitat underwater with the help of artificial gills made from denarial or jellyfish DNA. Increasing radiation levels meant that the team had to quickly find a way to expand the lifespan of their suits to survive. They decided to descend into deep waters. Eventually, the radiation exposure caused the Nidarian cells to mutate. This happened in stages. The captain, with the Aurelian gene, had to rely on mechanical interventions to survive. He became the first Nidaroid, a jellyfish cyborg hybrid. In stage one, the body turned blue and a bit trouble like. In M2, tentacles start growing from the now mutated brain. The captain acquires more jellyfish like characteristics at this point, and in M3A, a gelatinous bubble like membrane envelops the shoulder and reaches down the limbs. In M3B, a gelatinous umbrella was formed. Mature gelatinous uh, umbrella was formed. Maturity had been reached. The gelatinous membranes start taking over the mechanical parts of the body. This happened to everyone over the years, and eventually they decay into a jellyfish like organism. Throughout the years, the captain augmented himself with different technologies such as danger sensors and enhancers. His Nidarian abilities grew multifold, but perhaps the most interesting of his abilities was that the Medusae or the Umbrella released small polyps from the mouth region. Now, people from his crew mutated in four different ways based on the Nidarian DNA that was present. Eventually, they assessed their abilities and formed a society of hunters defenders, researchers, and builders. Being a resourceful lot, they realized the potential of using the polyp as a habitat. They started designing a structure that utilized four mature polyps from each of the species, along with mechanical interventions to form pods. Multiple pods occupied by one species formed one unit. These units together formed a corpuscle. Now, they also used various methods to successfully design these units. A synergy between the organic and mechanic elements was achieved. The occupation of the pods was based on how far along they were in the mutations. For instance, as the ones in charge, the M3s occupied the top unit. This unit was made out of two components, the, mid, me, the Medusae or polyp as the living quarters and the mech zone as the workplace. The design you utilize tantalum shells and structural cleats to break high intensity ocean currents to form a secured pod. The needle sacs help regulate water toxicity. Now, each species occupied one of the four units living together in harmony. A hallway like central connector connected all of these spaces to each other. These bridges here served as inter-unit connections, but perhaps the most important or interesting part of the corpuscle was the Genesis Tower, but more on that later. Now, years passed by and the population exploded and a neighborhood had been formed with many corpuscles connected to each other through armatures. Type A connected vertically, type B downward and to the side, type C upward and diagonal. These armatures were also basically uh, 
corridors connecting corpuscles. Multiple connection possibilities were explored, such as AC, a BC connection, a type AB connection. And now moving on, let's go back to the Genesis Tower. The neuroid corpuscle was designed to accommodate every stage of its life. In stage one, a neuroid baby starts from the bottom of the Genesis Tower, that is from the incubation chamber. Years after maturity is reached, in S2, they move on to the pod. They enter from the outside waters directly into the pod from the top. In S3, they start to begin the life of work and rest and contribute to the society in the state of the art sophisticated pod. Let's take a closer look. Now, this the pod uses a unique suction system with vacuum pipes to hold together the organic part with the mechanical. The vein like muscle network, the polyp being a jellyfish also has a gastrovascular cavity that helps in digesting small animals. The vein like muscle network produces oral arms that connect to the neuroid oral arms as well. A comfy bubble seat for a quick work break. A hanger for the needle mobile. Vacuum pipes running through every flow to keep the synergy going. The workspace of the nadroid. Now let's get a closer view of what's actually happening here. Looks like we've walked in mid surgery. Someone from the M1 stage is getting fitted with new parts by the builder. The builder, in charge of all the mechanical parts, uses this control rig for the operation. He derives all the energy he needs from the polyp by connecting to it organically. Here you can see robotic arms uh, that, from, that use parts from the replicator behind to augment the nadroid when the time comes. The replicator manufactures parts by using energy from the polyp and also an artificial source. The needle board, which is basically the surgical board, is designed to rotate in all different directions, controlled directly by the builder himself. These surgical arms are also connected, I mean, controlled by the rig. Here you can see the control rig as well. Now the rig is connected and plugged in directly to the humanoid himself. And there are mechanical arms, uh, which basically have these types of joints that help them move around easily. And this is a connection unit that is like connected to his uh, body itself. Now, once the job is over, they retreat back to the Medusa to rest. And they recharge via these oral arms that are present. Now here you can see the nexus point that is the point of the polyps energy. Then they move on to the sleeping pod, which is firmly attached to the wings. The nadroids enter through the side and rest. This cycle then repeats till they stage stage four. In stage four, that is the decay phase, they move back to the decay chambers in the Genesis Tower at the, at the top. Now, this is where they live to become like jellyfish creatures, and, and they, when they finally do, a ceremony is conducted where they're released into the ocean from the tower and they live as protectors of needles. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Thank you. Just a second. I must say I was not expecting that. This was quite ultra sci-fi for me. Super cool. <laughs> Thank you. That was so a good surprise. <laughs> so basically, like uh, you know, like feel free to just uh, jump in and uh, you know, like just comment, and, you know, like on whatever like you feel that uh, like might be useful for also like next chapters and ideas. Like they're all welcome, uh, Ariane. OK, no, because I don't know how many jurors we have. So if there are any ladies or anybody else, they can go first. I can go last. <laughs> the can, the can, ladies can first. The lady. the I'll jump in then. Hey, <laughs> hey, folks, can you hear me? Hello, you don't need hello. some or no one's going first. Awesome. So hi, Prasad. Um, amazing job that you did here. Thank you. Um, I was also blown away by the level of detail. Um, 
So something that I thought was really hilarious that caught my eye was this: these different connectors that you needed between the different species. So we need an A, B, but then we also need an A to C. It was, like I was getting like my own flashbacks to yesterday when I was looking for a uh, micro USB to HDMI adapter. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. love that there was there still still like very a real aspect of like not everything solved perfectly yet, right? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Um, I'm super intrigued by this um, protector idea, right? So I think for next steps, like, you know, I, I'm not quite clear of like who we need to protect from, right? So like as all of these beings like evolved, I'm sure that other sh uh, species that like are still you know, around that didn't die after this nuclear war also are evolving. So I'm not, I wasn't sure who the predator was, why it was so urgent. So I'd love to see development as you go to the city on, on like that front. Okay, yeah, sure. I was also thinking around the same lines because if these people evolve, that means that some some of the creature, other creatures must have evolved as well, right? So uh, yeah, and it just seemed like a right way to not just kill off the character and just have them like be protectors uh, in the end. So yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thank thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll just jump quickly and let the uh, let the invite the jurors like uh, give you the comments. I think like uh, in general, like uh, what I appreciate is like you were very clear and very uh, kind of like like kind of like very linear in in your design. So from the beginning, I think it was very clear what you were doing and you had it as well. Like you were very confident on your design, which uh, I think it was very, very smooth journey like uh, for us to comment and for you to develop and get the time to really get into all these details that we can see, on, especially like on, on the external part of the hill or the corpus. I think like the the only one comment like um, that I will give you uh, is that in the previous stage, in the previous chapter, you develop like three stages of mutation, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, and then the, well, there were four different species. I think the corpuscle is just missing that kind of mutation, this evolution okay. in time. Like I think it would be super cool to see, you know, what all that um, richness that you achieved from the previous chapter applies into this uh, living space. I think that's yeah. something okay. that it didn't uh, came across at least in the presentation. Um, will be quite cool, like, you know, even in this image here, if you start seeing how some of these uh, pods yeah. are less developed or more developed or something's yeah. happening to them, like, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, th I think like there is a nice uh, narrative there that you shouldn't lose as you go ahead on the project. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. 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 I'll work on that for sure. Thank you. Can I, can I yeah. jump in as well? Can you guys hear me, first of all? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, we're here. Excellent, cool. Because I had some issues with the headphones, so I couldn't listen to the first comment. Um, uh, well done, very well done. Uh, I think Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to see the next presentation as well, but um, I see an incredible body of work, which is very impressive. Um, and I really like this last image that be, because I think the colors fit a lot uh, your narrative. And speaking of narrative, I think the narrative was built very organically in a sense. Uh, what I would like to see though more is uh, the connections of, of how these things are coming in together, uh, how they aggregate, because you were jumping from uh, um, yeah, yeah. specific points of the, of the same view. And yeah. at some point, I mean, obviously the graphics were amazing, but it would it would make sense to have something simpler to, to show how this, um, these things are connected on how they aggregate. What does what are the systems A to A, B to B, B to C, etc. Because um, okay, yeah. I, I I believe that you've done it already. Uh, like yeah. as a thought or something. Yeah, so it would be nice to see. Process the model again. So yeah. Yes. So that, that's my only comment. Uh, very well done. Thank you. On, on Prasad defense, this is part of the next chapter. So yeah. we, we ah, push okay. him to not develop that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But okay. if you, so, if yeah, you join jump, the next chapter, I, I, jump, I jump the gun. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we lure you in. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to. I mean, I saw this thing and I was like, okay, I really want to understand how this works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, it's the next step. Okay, it's, excellent. It's a <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Hey, Prasad, let me just say uh, I was really satisfied, satisfied where we left things 
a few yeah. weeks ago with you and I'm really amazed now how far you pushed the this whole project. Uh, I didn't have a chance to look at the interior earlier, but it's yeah. it's amazing and the whole Thank project you. turned up really well. So congratulations for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so do we uh, do we have time for some comments from my side or we have to yes, move on yes, to the next we, project? We, we, okay. We have Eva, Eva and Tungo stop us <laughs> when we are okay. over this, so don't worry. Okay, so first of all, thank you. It was very it was quite amazing and uh, to be honest, this is the first time I have been invited to to be a jury for such a project. So I believe I cannot judge this or give any insight from the architectural or any design in a, in a realistic design discipline, but I have to jump back into manga world or this sort of anime world. I believe that uh, because I recently finished watching uh, Attack on Titans, the manga, I hope if you if you have already watched that, you notice that in between of each and every episode, uh, they use yeah. this sort of diagram, they use this diagrammatic um setting to explain yeah. some what i mean that technology how to how will it work but with some dimensions and the scales in a sense that to make it more comprehensible so what yeah. i would suggest is that despite the fact that you have already you have done this amazing polygonal uh, modeling explaining how this complex thing work but i think some 2d uh, some 2d diagrams would help and okay. um, even at the very beginning, when you are trying to set out your scenario in a very yeah. uh, in a sense to say that, I mean, the, the images that you were using, I think uh, they were very generic. You could have used a, a, a little bit more dramatic okay. in a sense that what's going to happen. And okay. for example, uh, even in your last image, in, 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 uh, in this part that it is moving, I think it would have been nice that you would explain like uh, on a bigger scale, uh, for example, in the uh, that there will be a, uh, a huge colony like the in the Star Wars. I think there is a swamp of Naboo, like they were using this sort of uh, to, uh, submarines that they were, you know, that they were going into that uh, bigger colony, I think. It would have even made it uh, make it more perfect, or perhaps you will show it in the next chapter. Yeah. Because I believe, yeah, I think so. It would be on the next chapter. Overall, it was amazing, and I yes. Um, the only thing would be that to use more, uh, some sort of diagrams, and for the first okay. image, because your first image is the roadmap of explaining how does this scenario would work. Because usually in, a, in, in Japanese manga, it will take like in, it will take like one or two season to fully understand what's going on. But in, the, in this case of having seven minutes, you have to be you, you, you. I mean, you can use a very simplistic diagram to say that, OK, this is how it works. And in a, um, one step at a time or level by level, this is the sort of scenario that we are laying out and then we are showing you these really cool models and each of them, how would they work? Overall, okay. it was very, very good. Super cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll work on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, also, everyone. Uh, thanks, <laughs> I just want to say two <laughs> seconds. Uh, yeah, that's like a, a Prasad really well done. I think that like there was like a lot of learning on exactly like balancing hard surface modeling and uh, organic shapes. And I think that like you told the story like again, like you were very true to your ideas from the beginning and you were fearless into going and exploring different scenarios and different, uh, you know, parts of the story. And I think that that really transcends so that, you know, you were a super superpower of your own. What I would comment on, uh, because like we've heard so many great comments about, you know, like uh, and ideas about how to proceed and, you know, this uh, ongoing conversation, I would say that uh, on the visualization part, just make sure when you're, you know, like uh, at each part of the presentation, because you were doing such an amazing job, like taking us through the whole story that the visuals also are as crisp right like uh, as you move forward towards like each and one of uh, the visuals that you have developed but other than okay. that really uh, beautiful work thank you so much thank you thanks Valine. thank you thanks Valine. okay taking over everyone now <laughs> thank you guys for the amazing comments and prasad you really deserve all these comments because you really worked hard for it 
So thank congratulations. You. Let's thank move you. on. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Prasad. Thank you. Uh, let's go with P1. Anya and Adet. All right, hello, everyone. Hello. Amazing project, Prasad. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Coincidence that we have two teams A1 B1 underwater. That's not uh, <laughs> that's not expected. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Anya Caples. And I'm not there. And, and this, this is through. The answer to human survival is not out there. It is here on Earth water. As we built equipment to travel off world for supplies, our world slowly deteriorated below. It was too late to search for answers amongst the other planets, forcing humanity to travel depths unknown. Hope has been found for a new mysterious crystal holds the answer for the future of humanity with its ability to deliver highly efficient energy and power the whole world's needs within a single ounce. A new civilization is able to rise and recover from the ashes. There's just one catch though. The mineral only works underwater. Civilization adapts using the deep ocean floor now as a celestial sky, a vision to explore and establish the previously unknown. The remaining structures above the water's surface are scarce, but vital to the network of cities as each relies on the other. Humanity is saved, but for how long? This is Cerulean. We designed a three chamber system. Within our upper pod, it houses our prosthesis regeneration zone. And in our main or central pod, our neuro network is situated, which controls the overall corpuscle. Located in our lower pod is a lounge area for connectivity between beings. So in our diagram, it is shown that we have four different layers. We have a bioluminescent lighting layer, which emiss is emissive and adaptive natural lighting, which expands and detracts based off of the emotion of our being. We have a main structure layer and an external water purification system, which protects against threat and provides clean water flow through a tube system, along with our bubble windows, which are emissive windows that provide visibility at the ocean's floors, as well as protection. And taking a look at sections in the plan, we're going to be able to kind of see the sort of the synthesis between the pod systems themselves. Uh, as you can see, kind of the structure is, is, is very organic. There's a lot of connection tubes that run through each of the pod systems that provide sort of a purified water system through each of the pods. Uh, and then there's lighting trails, of course, on the bottom lower pod, as well as the top pod for lighting trails that kind of illuminate organically the spaces with natural lighting. Um, and as well as you can kind of see the sort of the structure with the bubble windows and the way that the prosthesis kind of fits a little bit into the neural network system at the top of the central pod. Here we are looking at the detail of the top pod system. Uh, how uh, a prosthesis being would kind of look through it as if he were outside of the top pod, uh, looking into like the regenerative uh, system that's housed at the top structure. Um, and you kind of see the details around the pod and the way the kind of the external secondary epidermis is wrapping around, providing this lighting around the system. And here, what we're looking at is a close up of the bubble windows, highlighting their geometry and emissiveness. And like we said, they are protective against potentially also developed creatures throughout the 400 years that we've been living underwater. And this is our main opening to our corpuscle. It is where our beings are able to come and go and it really enters into our meeting space where they're able to discuss future things. Here's a general kind of overarching view. Let me go into what is the interior of the top pod system, how we can envision how the prosthesis itself is kind of situated into the space, uh, the sort of scale proportions, uh, and the way that kind of the illumination of the floor kind of really gives life to the scene and provides sort of almost like a cinematic feel for the prosthesis to kind of work through around the space. Uh, and you can kind of see how the regenerative system within the center of the, the picture kind of 
brings that home. And here is the brain of our corpuscle, our neural network, which is placed at the front of our central pod, like the captain of a ship. Our being is controlling the entire system. And this is the power crystal. It is what allows our beings to exist underwater at these depths, and it powers everything and makes it possible to be there. Whereas this is our neural network, which through the neural network, our being is able to harness that power from the crystal and use it to control the entire corpuscle by altering the texture, color, and emissiveness based off based on emotion. Yeah, and then here we are with the regenerative pod, which we talked about briefly a little bit before, and we kind of see a little bit more of the scaling between the prosthesis and the corpuscle system uh, of the pod. And kind of the way this is, the function of this is to kind of provide a replenishment and regeneration each and every day kind of for this prosthesis being, because it operates more intuitively and more the super kind of uh, within the span of 400 years in a super intelligent system, uh, we want these systems to kind of reflect that in, the, in their functions, that they're more intuitive, they're more organic in their, their approach. Um, and then we can kind of go through and see how with the next years of the uh, corpuscle connectivity starts to come about. Um, and I see different kind of connections, top, bottom, left, right, and the way that the corpuscle is kind of lending to a sort of more organic extension of its own self. And the more that it extends on itself, kind of, you could see that, you know, like the brain, the brain system, the central pod is like getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the vision is that, you know, there's one big connected brain through this whole system. And thank you for joining us. And we can't wait to further explore the depths of Cerulean. Hey, hey friends, I'm hopping in again. Bravo. Wow. I'm just like astounded by all these worlds. Um, I, I do want to comment that I, well, I loved how you framed it all via really focusing on these pods and like the four layers, right? Um, as just a suggestion for moving forward, I felt that perhaps the, some of the narrative portion could have been a little bit crisper in terms of what are like the challenges that you're solving and then this is their solution to it. I, whenever um, I would hear that, oh, like my mind would really grasp on is like, oh, this is the challenge. Okay, I get it. Like this is what they're then solving. But if that could be a little bit more like clear, like initial upfront big overview to then like, okay, I'm going along this journey with you, but I don't know why some of the turns we're taking, we have to we have to take them, for example, like I heard about the crystal initially, but then I was like, where did it go? And then it came back like later as the charging, but like a little bit more kind of overview to like glue all those four then together. Um, but yeah, I really liked the captain at the front that's all like plugged in, right? And that image of then like the brain will be getting bigger as like it grows and expands. So thank you. Thanks for your work. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, um, may I go? Yes, yes. Okay. Feel free. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Uh, it was quite impressive. Um, if I just, first of all, I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the fact that you use AI and you use the, uh, the uh, for the concept development or as a concept engine, you guys use that. However, uh, in most of your diagrams, I think uh, you were missing the, the humanistic or uh, how uh, I mean, in the anthropocentric part of it, like in the in terms of the scale, for example, it would have been good if you show if you show how like depending on the the job, depending on the size of the thing, for example, only in the neuro chamber, I guess, neuro network chamber in the one that it was connected to the captain, you were showing the, the sort of the how, how the object would connect to the human being and I think it would have been good if you if you give us a bigger picture for example as you might know whales um, in our in, in I mean in in our world whales they will uh, throughout the year they will 
dive thousands of miles, I think, from one ocean to the other ocean. So I think at the very beginning, you could have shown us as, again a sort of a roadmap saying that this amphibotic or this underwater uh, thing, how does it uh, does it travel under the water? I think for sure. And how uh, how in a sense that because you're mentioning the power crystal, something that it will uh, uh, fuel up the engine. I think the engine is not just for the uh, the operation inside, but I think it also works for the mobility part of it. So I think again uh, for the road uh, for the for your first slide, if you could again in a very diagrammatic way, you would lay it out for us. It would be quite understandable. How does this uh, to to imagine it more uh, better in a sense? Overall, it was quite interesting. I really liked the fact that uh, you were using these sort of veins that they were going around the body. It was very, I think that, that would be, I think uh, in our um, in our near future technology, this is sort of, a, you know, a kind of a neural link thing that is going to connect us with the with the electronical objects around us. But this was more in a very biomorphic way. So it was quite interesting and thank you again for sharing this nice project. Yeah, thank you so much for that. No, it'll definitely help us in our future. Hi guys. Uh, great stuff. I think like uh, I'm, I'm very happy like with uh, the kind of multi-layering. I think like the multi-layering came across very well. And I think that's something that types the uh, the living habitat to the language you use for the prosthesis, which I think it's something important as you develop the project, like to kind of identify the design language to kind of bring the whole story together as well, like a, more like from the design perspective. I think like in this chapter as well, like you had a chance to work a bit more on the pattern. So like the patterns, I, I would say like they're a bit underdeveloped, like a, Probably you didn't have time to get into that. Uh, there is like these multi layers and the functionality that you like, kind of like the narrative that you brought to those layers that somehow like were not, um, it was kind of opportunity for you to explore the patterns and to explore how to, you know, somehow visually represent what they, what they are trying to do. Right? Because obviously like if, you know, one layer is trying to do something and then the next layer is trying to do something else. We should then have like a, you know, a design that looks pretty much the same or like it's just kind of getting thinner or getting thicker. So I think like that's the part that I would say, you know, if you if you were to have a bit more time to work on this, like it would be it would be a nice thing to bring in because at the end, like once you see like this final image that we have on the screen, we see this kind of multi-layering, but like it's very difficult to identify what the different layers are trying to do. Just like, you know, as a guess, like, you know, if I could see, you know, certain things happening to the different layers, like like that will give you a hint. And I think that should be the goal for for, uh, for the design as well. So I think multi-layer, that's a great achievement, came across very well, like, like interiors and patterning, I think like, and then explore. Like, if you have more time, try to work on those. But great stuff. I think, like, also the the glowing effect. I think it's very successful. Like, it makes you wonder. Uh, you know, like this this corpus of like uh, in the middle of the ocean, like some somewhere in the deep waters. It's very cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, that'll definitely help us moving forward for the next chapter. Just, just when I echo the previous comment, I was uh, thinking exactly the same thing that um, it was very difficult to differentiate um, uh, tectonics on your building, on your forms or whatever that is. Um, and then obviously the lack of articulation was the reason for that. You described what the what the image or the space was doing, but it was hard for me to differentiate what um, what was doing different from the from the from the previous one that you showed? Um, so I think definitely 100% just try to um, fine tune this with patterns has been mentioned, or I mean also like uh, the scale. From someone previously mentioned as well, having something at scale there helps to understand people people to understand the function 
of of this element. Um, so you could have resolved it in a way just with graphics, but uh, I hope that you resolve it with actual geometry in the end. Um, I, I really uh, like your graphics. They're very sexy. And I love also your um, the final diagrams of how these things are going together. I like the symmetries that they have. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to see the next iteration of this. Yeah, thank you very much. I definitely agree with uh, the previous comments on just that the, the work is there and you've done so much of it and you understand very well like how everything functions. But uh, when you're presenting it again, like the challenge presents itself where, you know, like that's where, you know, the connectivity with the prosthesis always needs to be there, right? Like to understand scale, to understand functionality, to even uh, be able to imagine what this world could be, right? Like, uh, so that's like where these like connections and visuals are so important. And I feel also that um, since like you're going for this like very minimalistic monochromatic style, that's where there is opportunity also for, you know, maybe line work that could elevate, you know, like the story and uh, just like showcase like parts that might be hidden, right? Like to the to the eye or it might be difficult to read the form because they the all this like multi layer, uh, you know, like different layers that like you have and it's just difficult to grasp and understand like exactly like what, how these connections are building and how the functionality works so calling out things like having like a unique style to overlay now like the 3D design and now having this language, I think it's just going to be very beneficial for you in the next stages as you're developing and also like uh, this, um, you know, like dialogue with the prosthesis and the functionality. But uh, yeah, no, thank you guys. I think it's like a beautiful work, you know, like uh, you have so much more opportunity like to keep growing and developing, but like I think that your your project is definitely a very unique one. Thank you so much. Hey guys, uh, I have I have one comment. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, looks super cool. I like this flowing uh, flowing shape. Uh, but my only comment is uh, about this uh, mesh structure with with a uh, rectangle holes. Uh, and and the comment is that topology should not uh, control appearance. Appearance should drive the topology and. Uh, because when we are creating 3D model, uh, we are trying kind of create illusion of something real. Uh, and now people's eye is very trained to see if it's 3D model. And uh, if you see it's built from topology, it's immediately give you an idea, oh, it's just modeled, it's just a mesh. So my comment is always try to avoid uh, details that are grown directly on the topology of the mesh. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome. Overall, very cool. Yeah. Ooh. Thanks to welcome guys for the next chapter. But, uh, thank you for the full work. Great visuals. Okay. Uh, and thank you all for the comments. And then we move on to the team A. Thank you guys. Great work there. Let's move on back to A2. MSK and Maria and the balls which is fighting the gravity. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is A2 team, Maria and MSK. Uh, we present the project Pleiada. Uh, welcome to Neon, a civilization in Alaris built by Xiles. The exiles were split into two rival groups of X mutants and Y mutants. Everything changed when a massive asteroid came rushing toward Alaris. The elite members of each group built spaceship in a rush and jumped into hyperspace too close to the planet, thereby creating a massive hole which eventually kills them. All that survived were a small group of X and Y mutants who had been sent out to space in cryogenic vault set to return after centuries. On return, they found Alaris as a planet with a hole in the middle and discovered that the gravity has become unpredictable. Oh, Pan, you've muted yourself.
Uh, on return, they found Alaris as a planet with a hole in the middle and discovered that gravity has become unpredictable. They understood that the only way to move forward was to work together and build a civilization. They established NEON and created the Council of Exiles. The first agenda of the Council was the Exile Experiment to mutate a symbiotic relationship between both X and Y mutants to create XY mutant, which will provide them increased endurance, higher intelligence, ability for flight, and most imp important, a chance to survive. Both the mutants had different needs and requirements in terms of living and working spaces. Since they can choose the, to exit as a symbiotic being forever to attach only during necessary tasks and live as a solo entity. The establishment of the living spaces for the mutants was the next priority after the experiment. With gravity being unreliable, our vision was to make a structure that can withstand various gravity levels. We found a solution in our Alarian flowers and decided to take forward our experiments in spatial design with influences from these flowers. We are happy to take you through our process and our findings. We started by synthesizing a special biological compound which had similar properties to petals of the flowers. The dwelling pods were extended out of the main body by a service channel which can provide nectar and food directly from the main core to the pods. We also had to create specially designed furnitures and spatial features to cater to the zales in variable of their connection status. The bubbles also played a crucial part of our experiments, which had greatly increased the protection for the zales in times of disasters. Now let us look, uh, let us take you to our working prototype to get into further detail. Uh, now we reach our prototype, the Fliatum. We use the landing pods to safety enter uh, to Corpuscle. Once landed, uh, we enter the public space through the concourse, which has uh, the central beacon, which provided crucial information for the hive of exiles that will inhabit this unit through light and electromagnetic waves. The upper exit from the concourse take us to the control center, which will be operated specially by XY mutants. The workspace here uh, has been specially designed for facility and uh, easier integration with a whole prototype and can monitor the vitals of the entire prototype from one point of Access. We now see the entire Flayda uh, capsule from the control center monitoring the whole corpuscle. The first part is the private corridor, which serves as the private chambers for the Zales. At the top, we have the cluster for the X mutants and the XY mutants, who are the only ones that are able to fly. Below, we have the cluster for Y mutants, which can be accessed by a chute in the service corridor. The service corridor also takes essential items such as nectar and fruit to the Zales capsules. We have it surrounded by the structural veins which bind together the whole corpuscle and allow for future expansion with other units. The landing pads are connected to the structural veins. The second part are the public spaces which contain the concourse, uh, the, concourse the control center, the essential storages and a space where the Zales can hang out. The whole public space is wrapped in a protective bubble which adds the next level of protection for the Zales in times of disaster. Uh, the top part of Fliada contains more of the functional spaces. Uh, the bottom part contains more stronger structural er elements uh, with X and Y exiles in the approximately uh, in order uh, to monitor it. We also have an emergency exit tube to safety evacuate the exiles in case of the landing pads fail. We can see a better view of the control center and landing pads here with clear vision into the surroundings. We also have a prototype for the sleeping capsule detailed down here, a small glimpse into the sleeping unit of the exhale. The sleeping unit allows the exhale to rest and recharge by providing with energy filled nectar directly from the unit. It can also be customized as per the size of the exhale to give better comfort. The control center furnitures have the ability to split apart to make space for the X and Y mutants to comfortably get seated. And we also have generated an outline for the connectivity of multiple corpuscles that can take place in any of these ways to allow for a better urban space plan. The mass production of the corpuscle is set to take place soon and we shall start working on bridging the urban landscapes once our research team is ready.
Thank you. Nicely done, folks. I This is the third time I'm jumping in. I promise I won't do this every time, okay? I don't wanna establish some sort of order, but I do have much to say. First of all, stunning, beautiful. Like I just, I love this world. Um, I love that you took all of this inspiration from these floral and how you framed it of like the beings are experimenting, but we know it was like you, you folks are like experimenting with it. But um, I, you know, from the beginning, you did mention these experiments. Uh, first being the connection between the two beings. I was kind of then looking for like, well, how did that go? Did it succeed, right? I mean, you you said that you're moving into mass production, so I assume yes, but wanted a little bit more of like, how was that difficult and what are the differences between the two? Later on, you mentioned that there are two, the, the, the X, Y, once they come together, are the only ones that can fly. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, tell me more about the differences between them and then what the merging together um, brings in terms of functionality features or like betterment for that society. Um, and then of course, I know that like in the future, as you develop out this world, you're gonna be addressing this whole gravity thing and the hole in the world. I was like, okay, this is super interesting. I wanna know more about it. So I know that that's gonna be coming up um, in, in chapter three, but so far beautiful and great narrative framing, like the, the whole different challenges that they're facing. And this is how then we're solving it, like as they go through this new world, solving it for themselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, just two quick comments. I think like the, the first one is like, a, I really like how, how like uh, rich in, in the amount of different elements your, your kind of overall composition is. I think like you, you were not shy on kind of like working with just one geometry and trying to get everything to work from there. But you actually started adding and adding elements like more and more. So, you know, I, I was always afraid that it was going to become a bit of a, you know, like a, like a Frankenstein of different things. But I really love like how, you know, like you managed to compose all the elements together, similar to what you did in the prosthesis, which I, you know, I think I really appreciate. It's not an easy task to kind of have elements that have different nature and sort of like bring them all together in a composition. So I think that's a great effort you guys did. And second comment, I think like it's something you did very well is to kind of take us through the model. So going like, you know, very like assuming like and explain each part what he's trying to do and how that's tied in back to your thesis. I think that's very important as well, especially because you guys go completely wild on like bringing elements and you know adding more and more spices into the mix i think like it's uh, critical that you guys uh, take us through this journey like to to kind of explain what what's the reasoning be behind like all the different parts so you know like keep on going like that uh, don't 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 get shy as, as you develop your thesis like keep it wild and fun and um, I think like it's uh, yeah like in general like a uh, great exploration. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't have much comment. I mean, rather than to just give you compliment, uh, I really enjoyed the fact. I mean, your the, the storytelling, uh, the images that you guys used, it was very well crafted. Uh, thank you. It was I mean the gravity and. Uh, basically trying to fix it and create a civilization. I really enjoyed it uh, in a sense that, you know, it's pseudo situation with our planet that uh, if by the end of this century, we are not multi planetary species, we might uh, be our race or uh, we may we may not survive. So the fact that throughout the problem you are trying to fix it, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, the, uh, however, the hypothesis about the gravity and the fact that it was unstable, I would have, um, let's say that I would have expected more to work on that topic in a sense that how does the, the colony or these shapes, they would work in different uh, orientations. 
uh, because because that now that you are mentioning that the gravity in it is unstable, in what sense throughout the day or depending on the uh, geo uh, location? Uh, and then based on that, you could have mentioned that, OK, so this is how it would grow in different, uh, uh, let's say that growth system. And then the, the concept with the flower, it was quite interesting and, and obviously the color coding it is very artistic and the neon effect is so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll have to agree with uh, the previous comments that the narrative was spot on. Um, I mean, I kind of like space things, so maybe I'm a little bit biased. Um, but it was very clear and you just uh, managed to associate, I uh, suppose, a uh, form, geometry and story. Uh, colors also support that, so uh, well done uh, for that. Um, I really liked this point when you start going into the smaller scale and you start describing the shoebox uh, spaces and you say this can be adapted, etc. And so I would love to see more bit built upon that and how this can be adapted in a sense, like a series of you know different. Um, different let's say um articulations of those and um, if i were to find one weak point in uh, your project uh, and that's my personal opinion i would say that um it's the the circulation uh, in the sense that i mean circulation is usually the most boring part in buildings so i mean compared to that you actually did well <laughs> But uh, given of what you've done with the rest of the building, I think you could actually give it a little bit more thought and make it even better. Um, yeah, that's it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful uh, work, uh, guys. I'm uh, really excited to see that how it's going to develop in the next chapters because it just has so much potential with this beautiful you know, like a narrative, how it ties together, uh, chapter one, chapter two, like being so cohesive, so imaginative, you know, drawing you in. So like really excited, like to see like, you know, like the next uh, stages of uh, how, you know, like public, uh, there are going to be like more public spaces and, uh, you know, like the amalgamation then like of the core puzzles, how they'll come together, especially as, uh, you know, Alejandro was uh, mentioning, like said that, you know, it's so difficult like, to handle this kind of geometries where there's so many different aspects and to balance them out and uh, really create something beautiful out of uh, this uh, type of design. So uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting challenge like for you also like to, you know, uh, find this balance in the next chapter, but I'm very, very confident that it's going to be something amazing as it has been already. Uh, so thank you guys and I also want to just remind everyone feel free to you know take screenshots and share like uh, everything here like it's uh, you know like uh, open open resource like to just like share the work of the students so yeah thank you guys thank, thank you, you. I, I have a small comment uh, really cool one I like it I like the colors and the structure itself my only comment is uh, I really want to see some vegetation inside the interior because now it's so clean and the overall idea about the flowers, the nectar and stuff, uh, I think it will be cool to have some vegetation inside interiors and maybe in chapter three there will be more integration of environment with this kind of cell and more in kind of mix with uh, vegetation and stuff. Yeah, sure. Like in general, it. It, it's it's really cool. One. Thank you. Hi everyone. A uh, really beautiful presentation here. Just a couple of comments. Uh, I really enjoyed the narrative that you took us through. Um, I thought it was really exciting how you built this uh, really surreal sort of version of this planet with unpredictable gra gravity and seeing the type of creature that would have to adapt to that environment is really really cool. Um, I thought it was really interesting, the restricted color palette that you're using as well. Uh, it feels like very synthetic, but at the same time, I think with some of the colors that you're bringing into it, like the oranges and the blues, and it's it, it's starting to feel more um, 
uh, I guess like non synthetic, uh, a little more natural as well. So it's I think it's a really interesting balance that you're finding there. And I'm also really admiring how complex everything is and how much detail and the attention to detail that you've uh, fit into both your mutant models and and also the sleep pods and the actual architectural structures. I think it's it's really, really interesting, particularly um, I think this is the pod, the, the big model in the center here now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really interesting how it has like this sense of movement, even though it's it's not meant to move, right? It's meant to be stationary. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's really interesting how, you know, some of these like sort of gray and like the purple, like these, I don't know what you would call <laughs> the, um, what do you call those? The spectral? Uh, like the structural veins and the pots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really beautiful how you sort of like, they have this, this like sense of like movement to them. They feel very dynamic. Um, and it's kind of, it's nice seeing that, you know, with the balance of this sort of like organic shape as the core of the structure. Um, you know, I just think it's it's really nice seeing the attention to detail there. And I think the, the use of colors, uh, it, it's really, really interesting. It feels like very sci-fi, very, you know, futuristic, very uh, synthetic. Um, uh, I think someone just made a comment about vegetation. It might be nice seeing maybe a slightly like a, a different opposing color mixed in somewhere just to kind of like give it a little bit of variety because it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of purple, blue, <clears throat> um, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's really, really nice. Uh, beautiful job. And I, I was really admiring the the mutant as well and the attention to detail on the wings and everything. I really want to see the mutant animated now. But uh, yeah, beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your comments and thank you guys for this beautiful project. I would just say continue being the crazy you are like from where you start the journey is so beautiful to where you stretch to till the end. So just continue that. Thank you Eva. Thank you. Thank you guys. Amazing. Okay, let's go to team B, Itsu, Avakumara and Jessica. Hi everyone, I'm Yusra and with me is Bella and we are the retardants. So we're here to tell you a story of how we got here. We woke up one morning to this blinding light and the unimaginable has happened. It was the melting point. Everything felt distorted as Earth as we knew it was over. Flocks of people were running into this unidentified vessel and we followed them. It was supposed to be like Noah's Ark the haven, safe haven for humanity. It was supposed to be resilient to all known disasters. As we moved through the vessel, we hit some form of bioluminous forces that caused it to crash into extremely hot, arid environment. It was extremely windy. The heat from this tornado swells were burning through us. It was like we were in an oven. Our throats were dried out and everything started disintegrating. Our skin started drying off. It felt like there was fire, our flesh was burning, our muscles dried off, the moisture in our body was completely evaporated. The unimaginable has happened. It was almost as if we were responding to this extreme climate and everyone around us became skeletal, callous, desert aliens. We were, we were reacting in terms of organic cellularity in this extreme arid environment. Our posture became begin to evolve over time, becoming more compact, stunted, to give us more balance, making us more resistant to the forces in this environment. Everything felt different. Even our body, as we knew, it was mutating to the unbearable heat. No water, no sign of life, no fruits on the trees, just dried up branches, stones everywhere. Fractal hard ground. It was an alternate reality. We were became, becoming retardant the extreme arid climate cycles. As time went on, we began to seek new forms of shelter in this new radical environment. We began creating our new burrow made of fragmented rock pieces, pebbles and mineral gems, etc. These dwellings were typically made up of long carved out rocks connected through a central cave which serves as the heart of the dwelling. 
Each dwelling unit consists of a powerhouse, crawl chambers, research coves, cleansing chambers, and a nutrition space. The composition of these spaces vary according to its functions. Okay, so here's a tour of this retardant dwelling. It's our monolithic haven resulting from layered rock panels, translucent dust filters, thermal pebbles, bioluminous energy crystals, and more. Everything that we needed to survive this climate. The the dwelling is primarily rock the yeah the dwelling is primarily rock panels, which are the primary shell that holds everything in place. They are the structure main structural pieces that makes all the, that put all the components together. They also help us be resilient to turbulent wind in the climate that we are. The translucent filters protect the spaces from flying particles and serve as some sort of screen for dust and other tiny creatures. The thermal pebbles serve as insulation, storing heat and recalibrating the temperature in the chambers. The bioluminous energy crystals have several functions. Some of them are receptors for energy, help absorbing energy, filtering and conserving energy in the pods. They also serve as sensors for danger. The disintegrating pods that you see are as, as a result of the composition of the rock pebbles that we assembled. And we have put some translucent sheets over the openings to allow for discharge of waste and burnt energy. Although we miss Arc X, which was our new uh, our new dwelling, is still beginning to feel like home. The pieces are adapting to the need in this new environment. Sectionally, the different ports intersect or open up to this central cave, which is a hollow interstitial space that serves as a communal or gathering space. It also serves as transition space for the retardant to crawl and move between chambers. The crawl chamber, which is the most private part of the unit, is like a bedroom for the creature to rejuvenate, recharge, or retreat. They're equipped with sleeping pods, loungers, environmental filters, and calibrators. Although each crawl chamber has its private access, the dwelling unit is typically entered through the entry port, which serves as a primary access unit. It's equipped with safety mechanisms such as hanging lamps, scanners, data that collects data from every creature coming in. We also have the scanning port that screens the predators and the creatures for any form of defect or hazardous energy. Looking through in plan, the interstitial spaces and overlap of pod in the central cave is even more apparent. The research cove, which is usually next to the powerhouse, is an area for the returns to research and gain better understanding of their new form and environment. It's a lab with multiple cord or storage spaces used to keep the artifacts and place the retardants have gotten their hands on while scavenging in this new world. While the powerhouse is the energy center of the corpuscle, it feeds the other pods with energy and houses all the systems that controls the corpuscle. Here is a closer look at one of the energy crystals, which is the nucleus of the pods that converts heat to energy. Here is an example of how the retardants have assembled different disintegrating rocks and mineral pieces, interlocking them with the central cave. This is one of the crawl chambers, the one which is more vibrant and heated, made primarily of layered rock panels, thermal pebbles, and an energy crystal. It also features the shear lounge embedded in the wall and the shear lamp interlocked in an opening on the top. This is another chamber in which the returns rest. Primarily, the returns crawl around the space and lie down. The returns have created three families of furniture so far. One series, which are the carved out rock that have slowly been covered by blocks of mineral rocks and sand. We have the second series, which are the heat pieces, which are absorb heat or are powered by heat. And the third series, which are the heated rocks that are carved out of the walls of the chamber, similar to the carved, uh, carved cabinets or the carved stools. Over time, the retardants have begun to aggregate their dwellings into colonies, just like uh, similar mutants. The first system that they thought of connecting the is connecting the units through the central cave. This way, it gives them a vertical connection through this interstitial space. The second is a linear connection through the tips of the end of different pods. And the last system that they are exploring is the hybrid of both, which is a, both a vertical and a linear connection. 
although the future of the retardants is very uncertain, they're very excited about venturing into this dwelling creation and putting together different rock pieces and minerals. They have accepted their faith of never going back to Earth as they knew it, but they're finding new ways to be comfortable and productive in this new environment. And they're try also trying to carve out a new era for themselves, nestled in the cleats of this extreme environment. Stay tuned as we figure out how the retardants will fare in this new environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Wonderful presentation. I'm super happy to see like, that you are, you know, covering all the aspects of uh, the project and you really made the most of this like last week, like to put everything together and really like, you know, like tell the story. So thank you so much like for everything. I really appreciate also the theatrical, you know, like uh, part of the storytelling and uh, how, you know, like immersive the whole experience is like when you're, you know, like talking about your project. So definitely, you know, like uh, I applaud you for that. And I just love like that every piece of the story is there like uh, for us like to understand it in worse. And we could definitely like imagine even, you know, the next exciting steps about like how to build your world. Okay. Yeah, definitely plus one to the vividness. It was so I mean, the colors and like the realism at the beginning as you started with the it, I think you were in first person narrative at the beginning of like what happened to us and went through this horrific like even the adjectives were you were using of like callous and you're seeing these beings getting burned and like skeletal um so it, you know if you could even play that up a little more because like re retardant is like okay you're 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 blocking from sort of heat or fire right but so for the for the environment you know i would expect in chapter three then to name more of its attributes like how actually hot is it you know give give some numbers talk about how these stand like it's giving dune you know that desert planet in dune right with all these yellows um browns oranges and so then of course a question in my mind well you know what happened to water bring in water at some point because like i would assume these beings need some sort of liquid like is there any water how do they go around like that challenge or maybe do you know how much do they even need it anymore okay um I, I thought it was really amazing how you were like, oh, and we have three families of furniture. It's like, how oh, these folks are, <laughs> now they're developing like an interior design line. Like, this is great. Um, and something else though that you mentioned is there's other mutants. So I'm just really excited for the next chapter to understand how, if, if anybody else is still out there, right? And so how they then are gonna interact with, with other people. Um, in some sort of like hierarchy of society if there is going to be one um but i also want to say that that to that just top view like 2d diagram of the the housing structure was really awesome to like frame it and then you took us through each aspect so just kudos with the storytelling and yeah great project thank you well um, thank you if, if i can add something to that uh, first of all, um, congratulations. It was quite, uh, as mentioned, it was quite vivid. I like the idea of the Noha arc. Suddenly you just wake up, just follow the people, and then it turns out to be some sort of a disaster. And then the fact that there is, uh, the, the humans transforming into those beings, it reminds me of the movie I, I saw a couple of years ago, The Titan that they were uh, kind of working on making the humans, uh, they were experimenting on humans so that they could make them uh, biologically habitable in different planets. So it, the, the anatomy of it, it kind of reminded me of that movie, so I was just Googling through. However, uh, it, uh, the atmosphere of that planet was a bit different. Um, I really enjoyed the furniture system, the fact that you went so far in a sense that uh, you were um, kind of going into that realm. It was very, very interesting. 
and the fact that you were showing this entire chamber colony that how does it would how it would work it was really interesting and you showed this longitudinal section if you if you can go there it was very very uh, very prolific showing how uh, yes how that thing uh, that colony would work the only comment that i would mention there is that you could have had more people in a different color to say that um, uh, rather than, I mean, of course you can talk about the hierarchy and the role of the, the different species, how they would collaborate with each other, but as well as saying that uh, as a family, how uh, is this is this chamber for one family or for a certain family? It's a nuclei family, it's a community, or it's for the entire, uh, let's say, one village. So if you could uh, elaborate on that, it would have been interesting. And then, uh, for example, are these because I at the the, the bottom one, uh, these these diagrams that it shows very discrete uh, system of growths, linear, and then this sort of a fractal, uh, three dimensional growth of these things. Uh, you could have uh, elaborate a little more on that. For example, uh, do they mate with each other? And then the, for the new for the new people that they were come. Will there be some sort of, you know, small suites and then it becomes it gets bigger and then perhaps it could grow into an entire colony like uh, imagine one entire civilization. I think uh, those two big steps, if you could have elaborate on that and then you could have finished with the money shot saying that, you know, this at the end of it, even though it started very in a very tragic way, however, it ended in a very peaceful way and there is hope. I think that would be my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, <clears throat> I'm just gonna, gonna give you some comments uh, as well. So I feel like the first uh, the first comment, uh, I mean, as I was kind of listening to your presentation, like like presentation was great, and you know, like a, like a, kind of like brought us into into your world, which is I think like the, the goal for these kind of presentations. Especially when we are doing this like big leap into massive speculation about like potential walls, like you need to get us in there and then imagining that we are there. I was just thinking like in this extremely dry climate, like I was trying to question like the arrangement of your corpus itself, if it kind of makes sense that have this kind of radial arrangement. And then another thing is, you know, like you you might you you could have considered or like you might want to consider for the future like what's the kind of relationship with the with the ground level i know like we are kind of trying to not have a ground level but like it, it might be that you kind of want to have like this condition when sometimes like you are underground and then sometimes you are above ground i think like that could tie quite well to your thesis because you are kind of trying to protect yourself so it's almost like you design it more as if you were designing, like if you were creating roots that kind of need to get deeper and deeper. And as they get deeper, then the condition like of the environment changes for them. So like you kind of have one moment where, because I'm bringing this in because uh, I found your composition, like it has a bit of a lack of uh, hierarchy. Like there are, there are things happening by all means, like, you know, you have openings, you have patterns and stuff, but like, I can't quite find, like, what's the rhythm of your geometry. It's kind of like things are there, but the, there is not like, a, there's no flow, like other than the idea of having a center and having like these branches. So like, it might be that the reasoning for that flow is how, you know, like how protected you are from the sun. So it might be that there are certain areas where you are more sheltered already by the geometry. So you can be a bit more open, like, uh, like in terms of porosity and some other areas that you need to cover more and be more solid. So just like something to consider. And then the other comment is more like on the, like I think this is just like more on the geometrical side, like I think you should have tried to resolve the connection with the central piece. It looks still a bit uh, unresolved how the different elements are plugging in that central piece. Like that could that could be kind of a special moment, like where these things come together. 
at the moment they just seem to be kind of self intersecting. So it's just something like as you develop for the next chapter, because you're going to have a lot of connections, you might want to try to kind of uh, come up with a strategy for, for those connections. I think that's important as well. But yeah, uh, great stuff, guys. Yeah, I agree with Alejandro um, on the articulation of uh, both volume and and patterning. Um, I so I, I I really think that it would benefit. I think you have over designed a little bit um, the whole composition. So every opening seems that is well thought of on your end. So you kind of intervening like a godlike designer. Whereas I would like to see it a little bit more uh, as a rule based um, approach to this. So you by introducing more gradients, for example, and adapting, as Alejandro said, on uh, spatial conditions or whatsoever, I think it would definitely benefit your project. Um, and I started with, with my negative, in a sense, comment, uh, because I have wanted to pick up on Alejandro's uh, comment. Um, but I appreciate the fact that you uh, are doing something that is crystalline or prismatic. I know that it's not always, people, people think it's the easy way, but it's not really the easy way, to be honest. You have many, many more facets to deal with. And also, I find very, um, uh, I quite like the sensitivity of of you trying to display the space in a section or in the plan. Uh, I think it's very successful. Um, but yeah, if, I think you need to work a little bit on on the patterning to 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 show that this design is more organically grown rather than um, designed in a godlike manner. Hey everyone, great, uh, great job here. Um, I really enjoyed the narrative here as well. These are, these narratives are so well developed. Uh, really, really amazing job uh, so far on on all these projects, but. Um, what I thought was really interesting was how the concept art was super, super compelling and really well adapted to 3D. Um, it feels like you just plucked these structures straight out of that, that concept art that you generated. Uh, I think the cross section is, is really exciting to see. Um, I, I think, you know, from the outside looking in, you have these really sort of like I think the way you've arranged and kind of balanced the detail is is really interesting where you have these, you know, at the core of the pods, kind of that those broader strokes and less detail. And then as you get to the smaller pods or like these tangential pieces, you kind of like get into these areas of a bit more detail, a little bit more complexity. So I think that kind of balance is, is really, really nice to see. Um, it's also really helpful to see the utility that you have planned behind the design and the narrative that supports it. I think you have kind of like these layers that uh, really work well together and breathe life into the design. Um, the one the one note I, I had was on textures. I think um, when you kind of get into the texture variation, I think you could use a little bit more detail there. It's feeling like they're maybe all a little too uniform. I think you've combined the different materials really well, like having these like magma, like glass pieces with like, you know, juxtaposed with like the roughness and, and the hardness of the rock. I think that's that's like really exciting to see. But then um, I think one thing you might want to think about is maybe like the, the point in time in which we're viewing the model and how old uh, these, these structures are and how the different elements of the environment may have affected them. Um, you know, things like sun damage or burns or, you know, uh, uh, just different kind of like elements that might hit and affect the material over time. I think that might help uh, to make the structures feel a little bit more realistic or even like in the crevices, like do do different like materials, like kind of, you know, do you get a little bit more grunge in different areas? So um, that might be helpful to think through something like that. But uh, overall, again, I, I think the way you distribute detail throughout the models um, without having too much complexity in one area, I think you, you give us something that's like really, really interesting to look at. Um, and, and yeah, great, great job. I was very focused on, I think, the, the pod model itself, but a uh, really beautiful project. Thank you. <coughs> to, thank you all for the comments. Thank you guys for the projects. It was a challenging chapter, but uh, I guess uh, 
as it comes to happy ending in the end. We deserve the breaks and uh, congratulations. Thank you, John. Thank you. And we move on to the next team from Group A. Awesome. Let's go to Laura, A3. Yeah. Hi. Uh, let me go in. Hi. I will set everything. Go in presentation. Condivide. Um, yes. All right. You see my screen? Yep. All set? Okay, so let's let's start. So hi everybody, my name is Laura and today I will present you Cupularia. In the 2024 TF Century of Research, the robot on the robot of the life mission finally discovered a new planet called Varia. In Varia they discovered an organism capable of react to external stimuli such as solar variation and a radioactive storm, apparently a solution for the human race who have been fighting against the Earth's natural disaster for decades. But the rest of technology seems unable to study and replicate the organism. For this reason, they launched Project Necessity, recruiting a team of cyborg and implementing their body to survive at the Varia. The new cyborg was designed to live and coexist with the planet. In fact, it represents an internal living system that uses external agents such as solar radiation and wind to transform into energy and use this energy to allow the variation of, his, of its skin. But not just the body has to, be, has to adapt, also the space to live daily has to design according to the planet condition. And here we introduce you to Cupolaria. To design Cupolaria has been used a layer configuration which presents an internal core, a living area and a system. The internal core works as a power storage to accumulate and distribute the energy along the unit by the network system. The main functionality are divided as a blocks who are separated, providing different need for human as well as for cyborg. In terms of aesthetic, Cupolara is a deconstructed volume which allow the, co the coexisting of human species with the cyborg, which have dedicated area and path in horizontal distribution as well as in vertical distribution. In the internal core, which produces the energy, has been designed as a variable module that can, that can, um, that can, that can change according to different environment condition, create a different configuration to reinforce its surface and implement its, uh, the energy stored. Through an explore diagram, it is possible to see the layer um, composed of cupolaria. The protection is divided by the external armor, a deconstructed surface that provides a defense against the external agents, and the main structure, which have been functioned to sustain the unit and provide passage from, for, to move from one unit to another. The second part is the system, which is composed by the middle membrane. Well, you can hear. The middle membrane, which is, fun which is functions to absorb the photons and electronic forces and convert into energy. And finally, the distribution system, which brings the energy to the core from the and from the core to the units. In an overall, in an overall look, cupolaria. Uh, I have choose two main blocks um, and I highlighted two main blocks to describe the, the media lab and the growth lab. The media lab is an era of implementation. Positioning the body in a three structure mediator, the cyber implemented the armor with the extra organism. The mediator is an organic structure connecting into the block wall, receiving energy from the core and from the smaller structure passing through the cyborg. In the growth lab is where the extra organism is produced. The area provides a set of structure and environmental condition for the organism deployed. In fact, stored in a vertical wall, reachable by ramps, are a set of series of capsules. Those capsule is a machine cocoon which contain the organisms and provide the correct environment to growth. 
Thanks to the, to the Cupolaria design, it's possible to generate an aggregation for future expansion in Varia and welcoming many humans. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so who goes first? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, thank I you. Like, uh, I think like, you know, in general, uh, I kind of always like your your language. I think like it's, uh, you know, somehow you manage to keep it like uh, simple, but elegant. Which I think like, you know, when we kind of dive into these computational tools, it's very easy to be carried away by by the tools, like to overcomplicate things. But I think like <laughs> it's still like you know the final diagram, the final image is, is still there as it was in essence at the beginning. You were true to your yeah. diagram, and I think like that's uh, that's important element to to mention. Like it's you know especially like you know when we were adding patterns and we were adding things like uh, it was kind of getting a bit like messier. But like I think <laughs> like like uh, you know. At the end, like the composition is there. It's a very elegant, simple composition, very clear language, and I think like that's that's the strength also of the project. I think also like the diagrams uh, that you added for the presentation, it helped to to explain what you were trying to achieve. So I think that's uh, that's a great component as well. Uh, the kind of like the way the the project tied uh, ties with the with the thesis. That's like this kind of organism that is uh, enhancing the human uh, parameters or like modifying the human parameters that's something that perhaps uh, it could be a bit more like further explored like uh, how, how this brings uh, how the language is defined by your thesis but mm -hmm. in general like uh, you know the things create results like and i like the simplicity and the you know the elegance of the project you know, done. yeah Thank you. Thank you. And the <laughs> uh, Really nicely done. Um, it's an amazing project. I, I really like what you did with the uh, with the core. That was one piece that was missing while we were uh, together yes. those two weeks. So I think it think it's it's a nice accent to add to the overall composition, and it blends really nicely with the overall pattern. Uh, and uh, yeah, so. I think you should be very, very proud with your work. With your work. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, um, thank you, Laura. It was very, it was quite interesting. Uh, the part that you were talking about the cyborgs, it remind me of the one of this Netflix series, Love, Death and Robot, the Zima Blue scene, where the artist actually enhances his body screen through this poly um poly alloy and you know uh, and also pseudo um robocop i mean the the helmet it, it kind of looked like that it was it was uh, quite well crafted and the way that you were you you diagrammatize it it was uh, very very interesting and i i enjoyed the fact that you took time to explore like the you wanted to explore the mechanism of how does this system would work the internal core and in a sense that how you try to, you know, in a very in, in a polygonal and technical term, you were kind of blending the polygonal modeling with the discrete architecture. It was it was quite interesting to develop this kind of labyrinth of spaces and then making the argument that this would work as a, a kind of a Natalus style engine that it could provide, uh, you know, fuel and the energy for the entire system. My only comment there again, not in the realistic world, in the manga world, is that usually the core and the engine, which is going to be very fragile and it should be protected, it shouldn't be very exposed. So perhaps you could have used one of your shells around it in a, as a protective, uh, let's say, armor. Mm -hmm. And the overall, I think your first image, it was quite interesting and it was very understandable. The fact that uh, the, the, the angle of the camera and the orientation of these cells horizontally, yes, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, orient the, the overall composition and articulation of these mega pods creating this uh, uh, mega ship, 
with the background, it, it, it made it quite understandable that, OK, so how, how would it work? But uh, one item that is uh, slightly missing, I think it, it could have made it even much more better, is that uh, the, the, the inhabitants of this spaceship, they yes. kind of, they could have, you know, work around, like they could have been uh, as a for the repairing the parts or making some amendments they could have also be they could have been present over no, I there uh, i think you could have used some uh, those robots or at least just those cyborgs that they are capable mm -hmm. of working in that environment you could have added into that and the section the, the overall the section perspective of the capsule it was very very interesting very quite quite thorough and very understandable again how the the entire system could work at yeah, these sections do you try to explain that how this system could connect with each other i really enjoyed it uh, and the overall however i think for the i think for your last slide i think uh, uh, it, it would have been interesting if you cho choose each group. I think this is for all the groups that you would choose mm -hmm. one scenario in which that okay. Right now we are in two thousand four hundred something, but by the yes, for example, yeah, this one. How in the in, like in the very far further future, how would it work? Uh, this, mm -hmm. this this image explicitly is quite it, it, it is quite very good, but um, let's say that. Uh, but they are still not very sort of connected. They are in different colonies. But let's okay. say that if you could have uh, make your composition in a sense, make it more wider, more wider to see that more of these colonies, but somehow connected. Because I'm sure that through this discrete architecture, that this technique that you are using, you could have used it in a sense that uh, to make it more meticulous in a sense but overall it was very interesting thank you and thanks for sharing it thank you for your comment thank you so much yeah i was also uh, very much convinced uh but by both the narrative i would say and the way that it was presented like you know supported with diagrams um taking us step by step for how this thing is articulated um i think in any way, from any perspective, you see what you designed. I think it would look good. It has, I think it just has the right ratios overall. It's it's a composition, and I don't know if anyone else disagrees, but I think it it just it is there. It, it can be an object. It can be a master plan. It can be a spaceship. It can be anything. Um, I'm not entirely sure about. Um, different language of the core and the over uh, the superstructure let's say but as a narrative i kind of get it so i'm not going to comment on that and my only comment would be on the skin of, of the solution it's i mean i think this is the only one that you not you didn't convince me it's just i mean could it be something else i would like to see how this is growing in a more um, procedural way, in a sense, uh, like, or maybe it's not even a procedural way, but why is it looking like that? I I, I didn't understand yeah, that. I agree with you. <laughs> so, okay, good. So next time is gonna be better. <laughs> sure. Excellent. Well done. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Laura. Uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. No, go no, ahead, please Jesse. go ahead. No, no, you first. You first. <laughs> So I was actually like going to say yes, like it, it's absolutely like a beautiful language as uh, you know, like uh, the comments are like very elegant. I think that there is uh, so much potential uh, to add more complexity on, on the next levels, yeah. right? Like, so I think that that's where, you know, it's going to get like very interesting and more intricate um, and adding of uh, obviously like also like the component of like more of the um, public spaces and how they're going to be like uh, designed. So I think that here like uh, you really build uh, something that it's going to be giving you like great, great opportunity like for the next uh, chapters as we're moving along because again, like it's not just the amalgamation sector, the public sector, but then like the mobility, right? Like so you're basically like setting up yourself, I feel like for success with the simplicity and elegance uh, of your language uh, for much more complex and intricate systems um, in uh, to come.
So thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Hi, Laura. Uh, thank you for, for presenting your project here. A really, really beautiful job. I think one of the things I first noticed and admired through your presentation and the narrative uh, was the way you sort of progressed through different scales as you explained um, kind of your narrative, where uh, you kind of went down from you starting at the environment level, but then going into even the molecular level to explain kind of how these different um, structure, structures are built and how like the cyborg came into existence. I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and then I think in terms of the um, the structure that we're seeing, it's it's very perfect, very human made, synthetic, and I think your color palette uh, really evokes that as well. Uh, I think the detail on some of those shell pieces it reminds me of um, uh, uh, almost like silicon components or computer chips. So I think it also like uh, works really well to to fit within that narrative. Uh, I was also admiring on the cyborg itself, it seems like you're also sort of incorporating what reminded me of um, like scales or, or almost reptilian elements. And I think that's an interesting design choice because uh, it's it's very unique when we kind of think of this idea of a cyborg. I mean, we've seen how many science fiction movies and how many cyborgs, but I think you're presenting a very unique take on it where you're uh, inviting sort of these natural elements as well. And then you sort of like totally uh, uh, something really, really unique is like introducing this gold and like this organic shape into it. So I think that's a really, really beautiful design choice there uh, and a, a very different approach to kind of the design of, of what um, could be a, like traditionally accepted as a, the idea of a cyborg. So really, really <laughs> beautiful job there. The uh, 2D diagram, super helpful to see how the structure works and how it supports your narrative. Um, and it was also really helpful uh, for you to break out the different layers of mm -hmm. the, the ship to really explain each of their functions. And it really helps us to appreciate the design of each component, because otherwise it's a very, very complex ship, which is mm -hmm. great. But to break that out was, uh, I think, a really, really good choice. Um, overall, like really beautiful job. So thank you. Thank you again. Beautiful work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Really a great combination of uh, the overall narration, the design, the diagrams, everything is just so perfect in your uh, presentation. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. So let's move on to the P group. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Eva. Uh, let's go to the B. We have Michael and Kip. Hello. Hello. Ready, Michael? I am. Let me just get a little situated. I mean, that might okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Over thousands of years, a callous exterior has formed over a pocket of energy in a galaxy far away, creating a barren planet. This planet is largely uninhabited, yet it exudes energy across its landscape. Feeding off the energy of the planet are four individual roaming mothers, each a migrating intertwinement of entire ecosystems. These mothers embody a living system at all scales, within each individual as merely a fraction of a connected whole. The desert mother is dry and bony. The architecture is remnants of creatures of the past. The creatures are like mites and crustaceans across the surface, nuzzling in between dust and air. The water mother, light and airy with a sense of gravity different than our own. This ecosystem is filled with vascular, bubbly tubes with bulbous, slimy creatures meandering within. The Arctic mother is a cold, icy ecosystem where the architecture is calloused. The creatures are giant and slow, conserving warmth and energy for her. In this ecosystem, the offspring are more nurturing than the mother herself. The forest mother exists between forest treetops. We view it both from above and below the canopy level. The creatures here crawl and hop. Roaming between the utopic mothers exist two keepers, which have the ability to wield energy in a way that the mothers cannot. The Arctic keeper is hard and meaty. The blubbery mushroom-like forms help to keep this keeper warm while taking care of the harsher mother environments. 
The forest keeper is crunchy and callous with pine cone prickles protruding out from the core of the keeper. These forms help to catch and store energy in their nooks. These keepers are a team functioning as individuals in a larger whole. Together, they ensure the order and flow of energy is respected and shared amongst some other creatures. Here, we can see the developmental stages of an Arctic mother cell. Starting as merely a shell of just cartilage, the Arctic mother cell in its younger form feels like a brushstroke across a canvas. As the cell develops, we see a thickening as the form becomes more robust. In this stage, the cell has ribbed enforcements to provide structure as the softer forms begin to callus. In the next stage, the cell appears to become carved and eroded similar to canyons on Earth. As the cell develops, branches are formed to act as infrastructure for efficiently distributing the energy amongst the cell. In its near final stage, we can see the cell develop the defining characteristics of an Arctic cell, with the branches resembling columns and the cell forming grooves to keep pockets of warmth within. In full maturity and light, we can see the final stage of development. Here we can see the developmental stage of a forest mother cell. This cell starts as merely a cluster of atoms forming around a bundle of energy. As the energy multiplies, it allows for the forest cell to harden with maturity. As it grows, the cell starts to develop umbrella-like forms, which create a counterbalance to the weight of the energy. The forest cell develops forms to cocoon itself in from the harshness of the barren planet. In the next stage, the forest cell begins to bloom, shedding some of the petal-like protection forms. This begins a grand metamorphosis. Here we see the forest cell raw in its mature state. As the forest cell settles, it begins to reinforce itself for the final time with life as the energy infrastructure is grown. In full maturity and color, here we see the final stage of development. As we rotate around the mature forest cells, we begin to see a whole new level of detail as we peer into the intricate caverns within its form. We can see the taxonomy of details as our eyes travel from the green rocky parts to the softer orange parts. In addition to the private nooks, crannies, and caves, we can see a series of communal public spaces. This ma mature forest cell activates as the cell continues to grow details as energy is infused. The more we peer around the cell, the more we can see a, the utopia that is becoming. As we rotate around the Arctic mother cell, we feel icy and cold. This mother appears to be made from two materials, each reacting and responding differently to the harshness of the environment. Seasoned by the bitter frost, the pink part feels prickly and cold. There is a sharpness in their geometry, jutting out like icicles. The blue blubbery parts of the mother cell respond to the cold by becoming calloused. These mother cells are ever-changing and developing which can be seen by the wart-like textures forming on parts of the blue. When we look inside the mother cells, we can see the migratory pathways that, are creature, that creatures take throughout the space. In this view, we can see the multiple elevation levels for the creatures to reside within. Inside the Arctic mother cell, there is a feeling of magic as we see the energy blooming within the mother. The fountains are activated with raw energy particles exuding throughout, allowing for interface between mother cells and the creatures who reside within. As the energy is processed through the mother cell, it becomes viscous and stored for later use in the pods. These energy pods are stored through cells here, which we can see in the columns of the interior. Here we can see the energy pods stored underneath these callous mushroom-like forms. The more that we look at the Arctic mother, the more that we can see detail and purpose. When we look inside the forest mother cells, we can see the vertical migratory pathways that the creatures take throughout the internal system of caverns and nooks. In this view, we can see the multiple caves that the creatures reside within. As we travel through the forest, we see the utopia of life. This form feels like a tree house. As we travel up the trunk of this cell, we see canopy that forms for shade and privacy. 
Zooming into the canopy, we see a plethora of fountains which bloom with life. These fountains act as interface between the mothers and the creatures within. For the shy creatures in this ecosystem, there's also an energy waterfall that allows creatures of any size to access energy. Similarly to the Arctic mother, we see the processed energy stored in bulbous storage pods. These pods can be found underneath the bulbous mushrooms as well. The more we look at the forest mother, the more we can see detail and purpose. Here we see the rare occurrence of the keepers inside the mother cells as they wield energy to maintain the mothers. We must be quiet to not disturb them as these monolithic keepers appear small and sensitive as they care for the vast mothers. As these mother cells mature, they are ready to grow and amalgamate with other cells, creating larger migratory mother ecosystems. And these cell systems, like stays with like, with the Arctic cells drawn to other Arctic cells and forest cells drawn to other forest cells. But similarly to the evolution on planet Earth, the cells evolve sometimes in unexpected ways, as we can see the forest and Arctic cells have grown together in this spot. Here we see our cells in their final form on the barren planet. They are ready to grow, divide, and multiply into mature mother creatures to nurture their ecosystems within. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful project. Uh, definitely one of those that like has such a unique voice, such a unique, you know, like a representation. Everything is so beautifully cohesive and, you know, it takes you to this uh, dreamy, you know, place. And I just love the poetic narration and how you're really like, uh, you know, like sticking to the National Geographic style of things that like, uh, you know, and the representation like that you would really think that this is actually happening, you know. So thank you so much for really the beautiful work and the consistency throughout the whole project uh, and also like just seeing how like you guys also are growing as a team and uh, how well, you know, like this communication goes between you and it really transcends. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys. Uh, I think like, you know, very well put together. Like I think uh, you guys did an amazing job like uh, I think like the, the results are super impressive, like obviously like uh, in the amount of detail and the amount of effort that you put into developing all the different stages. I think like you should be very proud of that as well. Like you took us, I'm like very glad that you took us actually through the evolution of all the different spaces, which I think it's, uh, you know, it's like, like it's beautiful, like as you're kind of like showing us like how the things are developing and like why they're developing and what's the narrative behind that. It's like a beautiful story all put together. And then I think like this is just result of like your commitment and like, you know, the amount of effort and constant research that you were bringing in like every single day, like just like new exploration. There was a lot of like, you know, trial and error. Like there was a lot of things that, oh guys, like this, maybe like we remove that one, maybe let's add, let, let, let's add things here. But like you just kept exploring more and more. And I think like, you know, you can see the results like uh, coming and like kind of paying off at the end of the day. I think it's just going to be a super exciting thesis like uh, to see how it developed through. Uh, yeah, I just think like, um, you know, like uh, you, you, I know like it's a, it's a lot of effort because like you kind of having all these different um, like iterations, but like it's really like kind of taking it to the next level. Like I don't know how you're going to develop it as you keep growing, like it's going to get more and more difficult to kind of like uh, you know, keep the entire narrative there, but it's, uh, you know, it's a beautiful story. Like it's, uh, you know, like you can see like it's a full ecosystem. Like, uh, you know, the way you describe like the keepers and like, you know, like nature and all the different species. And then like your your living space itself is, it's like, you can see how it's ecosystemic as well. Like, I think that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant aspect of the thesis. Very well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to strengthen some of the comments of Mike, uh, of Pavlina and Alejandro. I think I really think you have uh, a unique language from all the groups and it's your your design really it's quite different from all the others. And I think that's a, that's a great thing. It's, 
really, it's really artistic and uh, soft and organic in a way. Uh, the only remark I, I, I have is uh, not sure how this is going to grow in, in the next chapter. I think you guys will have some difficult time to manage with the uh, strict uh, rule, rules control uh, rules control uh, aggregations that you need to to make. So that'll be that'll be a challenge. But other than that, uh, really nice, nice work and it's a beautiful project. Thank you. Um, OK, um, I think uh, well, thank you guys for the very unique and uh, very uh, discrete lang design language that you guys uh, implemented here. Uh, as a person that I'm kind of uh, I'm, I, I'm really into this science world and biology uh, just as a habit. I remember that uh, watching Richard Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about Given the fact that the major elements in the universe by uh, by far that is being explored is uh, helium, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon and uh, nitrogen. Uh, usually uh, the fact that uh, we will we would have even if the if life on a different planet is going to be is going to happen, uh, we will have eyes for, for the sake of the visuals and uh, we will need to have hands. Uh, however, in a very artistic way, the fact that you guys uh, take inspiration from the nature and you show this mushroom with the flower, the fact that you were using that, it was quite interesting. Uh, but in, again, uh, going back into reality, I want to just mention that somehow you, we might have to show uh, some sort of, uh, you know, um, earth type, earth like, uh, um anatomy let's say we might need that because we are the result of a billion of uh, billions of years of uh, evolution but uh, the overall again the overall design language and integrating it into paintings of um, victorian style paintings and the overall showing this sub universes uh, it reminds me of uh, like a lucas arts games and the studio ghibli mangas especially the Valley of the Wind. I was just, again, I just tried to Google the names so that uh, uh, going through your presentation. However, if I, there is one item I want to add here is that in each of these sub universes, it would have been uh, interesting that you would show uh, rather than, I, I noticed that you guys were describing the nature and how the, the ecosystem would work. I think, uh, it would have been more interesting if you would show a kind of a, a more a kind of a colonies of these beings, how they would interact rather than just talk about the beauty of it, because we all know that is it's quite beautiful. I think the the protagonist presence it was uh, slightly missing, uh, slightly. I know that in some of the sec, especially in the section diagrams, you were trying to show to show them. But I think if you have add more into it, it would have been interesting. However, uh, again, uh, you have a very, very unique style in representing and even the uh, the narrative. Uh, it was sort of uh, like the BBC uh, David Attenborough style. It was very, very, uh, let's say that uh, mesmerizing to follow each step that it would basically each of these scenes and shots were going to the next. So thank you for that. It was very inspiring. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, um, Kate. Hey, Michael. Okay. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Uh, beautiful, beautiful project. Really beautiful narrative and delivery. Um, uh, I thought it was really, really beautiful, beautifully written in, in the delivery of it. I think it, it was just very, uh, it felt like a story uh, and you definitely took us on a journey. And just want to say the, my first reaction and reaction seeing this is like, wow, it's it's so exciting to see. Uh, I think the number of models and I think like showing all these different uh, viewpoints for each of the uh, like the structures is really, really great to see. And just like compositionally, um, just how you've arranged everything in this radial pattern around the larger landscape. It's just really, really well composed and even seeing um, we're able to just appreciate how the color transitions, you know, between 
uh, the two sort of like opposing landscapes. It's really beautiful. Um, and also love the scale and love seeing the larger environment and then, you know, seeing it down to how the mushroom keepers fit within these structures is really beautiful. Um, I actually, I really love the mushroom keepers. I think it's a really uh, unique design for a, a creature uh, where it is like very humanoid, but I actually love that they don't have all of the pieces of traditional or what would be expected from like human anatomy, but you know, they don't need the eyes because they can just feel their way through the environment uh, by feeling the different energy, which I think is is really, really unique and, and really interesting. And uh, loved seeing the energy flow uh, between the two keepers. It's so imaginative. Um, so really, really nice, nicely done there. I also thought you did a really great job of showing the progress of the evolution um, of the actual cell itself uh, and how you did that without color because it allows us to really appreciate the beauty and, and the detail that you're putting into the model itself without the color. So I thought that was a, a really great way to present that. Um, yeah, uh, overall, I'm just seeing a lot of beautiful organic shapes and forms for the umbrella pieces. And I think um, the way that those came into fruition, you know, it also feels very logical, like it's a form of, um, you know, the structure growing and building on itself to, to support itself against gravity, but also providing sort of like natural uh, protection from the environment. So I think it's a very logical way to like go about creating that and imagining how that would grow. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's really great seeing, I think just like, again, mentioning that larger landscape image, I think was really helpful to see because the, throughout the presentation, I felt, I don't know why I felt like the structures themselves were really small in context of a larger environment. So seeing that, no, they're actually like these huge structures that the mushroom keepers live on. Um, maybe it's because mushrooms are like very small to me, like, because they're, they're very, you know, small, um, you know, pieces in nature. So I was imagining everything to be much smaller. So seeing it on a larger scale is really helpful after you kind of took us through how each structure is built. So um, really beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just to close off as well, um, uh, amazing presentation. I was very, I was immersed. Um, and it rarely happens with me because I'm, I'm more interested in technology and not really on, de on design that much, I have to say. So it's very hard to keep me like 100% focused on one presentation. You guys uh, managed to do that. So congratulations. Um, I'm not going to repeat all the comments from the previous um, critiques. Uh, I agree 100%. I was just trying to find something bad to say. I have because I usually do that. I'm a bad person, but um, I couldn't find anything, uh, so I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna end up just with a couple of thoughts of how this system can be uh, self-sustained in a way. I would, when as you were presenting, I was imagining this as a as a thing that you just leave it there, you program it, and it grows, and you just come up like a, a month later and you see what's happened, and. So that would be very, very exciting to to see. But uh, I think also it's a very great challenge. Um, well, if you manage to do it, uh, let me know. And <laughs> I can definitely have another look. But congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the amazing comments and the amazing projects, guys. And I'm working with you and uh, keep pushing. Next chapter, we're going to have a surprise everyone in the months and half. Thank, Thank you. Thanks so much. And we move on to group A. After the next group, we'll have a um, 10 minute break, so yes. we'll have one more project like to see now. Hello, guys. Hello, hello. Sorry, sorry. I was unmuting myself. <laughs> Are you ready, Ryan? Okay. I think I am. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like we are Let A4. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Gong, and this is my bed, Ryan. Hello. Okay, we are so excited to share you all to our world of contradictory symbiosis. Let's start it. Okay. Humans often had a false belief that they were the center of the ecosystem 
and habitats should be built in a way that added their living conditions as if they were operating machinery. This was an illustrious illusion from the 20th century, which failed to bring balance to the ecosystem, but instead introduced architecture as an outrageous tool to fulfill the ambitious dream of consumer capitalism and excessive exploitation of natural resources. It took us almost two centuries to finally realize the mistake we made, not only to our own species, but to our life on this planet. In this post-apocalyptic world with insufficient resources and human extinction crisis, the Cyborg Republic invites humans to transcend into cyborgs. However, to embrace the total rationality of cyborgs, humans need to eliminate their emotions. In order to persuade humans into becoming emotionless, the Republic spreads propaganda in human society, brainwashing those from the lower class into believing that they can experience eternal happiness by becoming a cyborg. In reality, their brains and bodies are stimulated constantly by the prosthesis. The chemicals produced by the brain will be collected for agricultural use. Their emotional capabilities are built to the point that they can no longer f produce any work chemical substances in their brains. There are now cyborgs working as labor forces to restore nature until their organic body decay. The Republic produces and exports food and natural resources back to the human society, just enough to keep them alive, but not enough for them to overpopulate. As long as there are humans who live miserable lives out of poverty and hunger, there will be new volunteers to join the Cyborg Republic and keep the system running. This is an ironic narrative suggesting that a sustainable and peaceful ecosystem could only be done by eliminating the presence of humans from humans themselves. And our story begins in a place called Euphoria. In order to bring eternal balance to the system, it requires the synergy between the living and the non-living in a comparable amount. Unlike any ordinary form of architecture found in human society, euphoria isn't designed as a machine to serve inhabitants, but the inhabitants themselves actually serve as an organic system that drives the mechanical system. Both systems are designed to work together in a form of symbiosis relationship in order to facilitate the overall system. Euphoria acts as a corpuscle of the Republic, where each particular unit functions as a living cell that collects infinite amounts of emotion from the inhabitants process them in form of resources and feed them back to both the central system and human society. The population of Euphoria is composed of three different types of cyborgs, where each of them coexist in different sub-areas. The first type is the newcomers with plenty of emotion called liberal. Liberal can use their happiness to purchase more processes to achieve even more pressure in this delusional fantasy, up until the point they are fully equipped and eventually transform into the next stage known by the name of Felicita. In this stage, they will be able to reach their eternal happiness for several weeks before they run out of emotion and fully transform into a pure cyborg titled by the name Acheso. Acheso is a transient form of humans where they surpass human physicality and intelligence, but more importantly, they are able to eliminate the ultimate restraint of human beings, their emotions. A single unit of a corpuscle is composed of spaces with four main usages. Each space is designed to perform specific functions which are compatible with certain types of cyborgs. Let's begin with this pleasure dome, an enclosed psychedelic built environment specifically designed to maintain the ecstatic condition of Libro and Felicita. Under this dome, they will be constantly stimulated by a psychoactive fog released from the diffuser and the massaging chair that produces high intensity of ecstasy, which can't be maintained by the prosthesis itself. The sensors integrated into the lighting system monitors the status of the environment and the state of the cyborgs for fog concentration control. There are a total of seven domes in each corpuscle. Each of them offer different psychedelic experiences in various intensities. The cyborgs are able to earn more prosthesis and use them as a ticket to assess higher levels of domes. During the night time, they will all head down towards the charging station through an elevating platform to recharge their batteries. But more importantly, to feed their energy to the system through the connection between their spine and the charger. This area also serves as a prosthesis equipping area for those who purchase an upgrade. Down below the charging station is a research center. 
the intelligence unit of the compressor and the major workspace of a chaser, the emotionless cyborg working non-stop for the Republic. The energy collected from Libero and Felicita will be directly transferred to the pipeline and stored inside of the emotion cells that spout out from the organic veins. Later, these emotions will be used to develop new forms of stimuli and agricultural resources with the assistance of the sensors, which keep track of and control both humidity and lighting conditions. Finally, all of these micro units are interconnected together with a mechanical frame. The frame was designed to support both structural and logistic aspects of the corpuscle. The hallway leads a chaser to different areas, and the rail system transfers Libero and Felicita to different domes while they are asleep. The internal layers of the frame consist of multiple pipeline systems for energy and resources distribution within the corpuscle. Multiple corpuscles can be interconnected using the connector nodes and the receptors. Ultimately, all of these spaces will interactively work together, not as a separated system, but cohesively and efficiently integrated together to form a perfect synergy throughout the corpuscle. Euphoria is a blueprint for the creation of an ideal ecosystem. Not only is it designed to support the different aspects of living in this ecosystem, but it also demonstrates an ideal concept of sustainability and fair exchanges between multiple entities. The organic system couldn't mutate independently without the assistance of the mechanical system, while the mechanical system is functionless without the emotions collected by the organic system. These two complex systems of contradicting fundamentals complementing each other, greatly echoes with the ideology of contradictory symbiosis which, we, the Republic, strongly, believes in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, guys, you just never fail to blow my mind. <laughs> I think you need to like make the lady say at the end, Mike dropped. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you know, it's just one like project that like there is just so much like vividness to every aspect of it. Just uh, so much, you know, like uh, interest and love to what you're doing. Like you're just so fearless into like really like venturing into the storytelling and, uh, you know, like uh, really thinking about the storytelling in each aspect of it. Nothing really feels redundant. Everything is absolutely, you know, like beautifully crafted uh, and explained and they were just you know for me like really cool those guys like you're just killing it you know like uh, beautiful beautiful work so proud thank you so much i just want to uh i just want to add two words to this uh this was absolute fire <laughs> thank you that was awesome yeah. really really cool to see man. that's a great storytelling the graphics are amazing um yeah at, Nothing. I mean, that's literally all I have to say to that. Thank you very much. I'm Thank glad so that much. I put this so that, that could impress all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for the very impressive presentation. Unfortunately, I missed a couple of last minutes, I think due to my VPN interruption. Uh, but I must say that uh, for the very beginning, the, the pseudo Ultraman suit, that you guys used it was absolute because I am a fan. It was it was absolutely amazing. Uh, the evolutionary apparatus that was adding into it it was perfect. Uh, the pleasure dome, the flow of the design, the color code, and obviously the subtlety of your design repertoire. It was very, you know, for example, yes, in this image it was going through this kind of as um, IC units, uh, this like a motherboard chips, and then at the same time in a different uh, in a different zone, it jumps into this very uh, James Torrell style of lighting installation. It was perfect, and obviously the the diagrams that you were explaining, I think that was exactly what I meant for the other groups that uh, how you should basically frame your narrative. And obviously, even though the, the entire system as a the, the entire collective system, it looks very meticulous and very, very complex. But yet once you zoom in the, the details, once they start to uh, reveal themselves, it is not that uh, ultra complex to follow. 
it's it's very easy and subtle too. It's like a dream, basically psychedelic dream. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much. I hope that you guys will present or there would be a sort of a, you would publish it in some place that we could look into that more. Thank, thank you. you for your kind words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a type of project that it's so spectacular that it, it's hard to comment on that thing because it really speaks for itself. So, yeah, great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. To just to add on just very briefly, I think like the I think the, the interiors uh, like really happy at the way you guys develop it. Like uh, I think like it was really adding on to. What, what we had from last time we met. Mm -hmm. And in general, like this kind of green to pinkish language is something uh, that is kind of working very well for you guys as well. And this dialogue between the greens and the pinks. I think like that's, uh, you know, like try to keep like uh, some of these kind of like strong design elements and kind of like language when you are presenting for the, for the later stages, like the, the next chapters. I think like you've like you've come like both with the first and the second chapter, you came to a great language overall, and it's something to embrace and to develop further. It just makes you like you're not gonna miss it like uh, you know as you as you have to bring in more and more detail. I will imagine like you know once you have like the full city, I will imagine these two colors also like highlighting like, different areas, and it's just gonna be very very exciting. It's also like, you know, like a great effort, uh, like this kind of, um, this scene, uh, this interior image where you have uh, all these lines. Uh, I think like, you know, I think that there was like one of the, the smartest applications that uh, I think uh, among all the groups on kind of like bringing in some kind of computational touch without uh, you know, without doing a pattern like a like kind of classic like a tessellation or anything, you were kind of bringing all these different uh, instances and proxies like a parametrically control onto your geometry. And it's an image that you could think that, you know, like it's just like kind of manually designed, but like the fact that you have like that uh, computational intelligence on the way you uh, model some of these elements, I think that's something commendable as well. So, you know, like those things that don't come across that were done like in certain way, but they are here and they're working. I think this is like, you know, what's proven to be a successful design. And, and the kind of combination, right? Like the, when you go from one interior image to the other interior, for me, it's actually like more exciting the interiors themselves than the exterior. Even though like, you know, I started liking the exteriors a, a lot, like when we, when we first met, but I think like the interiors they develop uh, so well that they kind of like took over from the from the exterior, which is, you know, like it's nothing wrong about the exterior. It's just like the mm -hmm. interiors like took it to the next level. So well done, guys. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, congratulations from me as well. I mean, I, I really don't have anything to say. <laughs> no, no um, it was uh, it was excellent. That's my only comment. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys for the psychedelic pills that you gave all of us. So <laughs> we all are just lost in your world. <laughs> just want to say, as always, you have like really, really amazing work to blow our minds off and just like a, a huge success for your project and congratulations. Thank you. I think then we can take a break. If 10 minutes break, yes. Yeah, let's go for 10 minutes break and come back. Thank you so much, everyone, and see you in 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. cool. See you in 10 minutes. ecosystem. Thousands of cultures, economic systems, and natural resources shared have changed their entire system. These landscapes range from urban environments to desolate lands that once held prominent civilizations, thus sit away to time. 
Millions of years of exchange, resources, ideas, war, and many others have resulted in the environments you see today. The habitants of this cosmos are called the feral figures. They are representation of the humankind, creatures in the form of preserved reminiscent of the human, King Tut of the Interstellar. The feral figure are divided into groups, depending on the purity of their formation. An elite breed made up mostly of engineered prostheses with lack of emotion, a beta breed that makes up the majority of the population, and a malfunctioning product that failed to be classified under an advantageous breed. A collection of emotions between protecting those emotions while simultaneously oppressing them. In an effort to define what an intimate, a compact, and an efficient dwelling unit will resemble in a rapidly evolving world, the corpuscle units have evolved into recharge and represervation of the feral figures, a sanctuary or a lair or a haven. The feral figure represents the heart of the corpuscle to activate it and acting as a hideout space for the figure to escape further eruption and continue the preservation of what's left of the human race. The unit to address and include metabolism chamber or a recharging pod, a resting chamber to release heavy weight or emotions, an delicious interior cladding with soft fur texture to cradle and preserve the glass shell that is the body of the feral figure and prevent it from cracking. The interior creates interwoven spaces, interlocking and intertwining in an effort to showcase the complexity of the feral behavior. The corpuscle is made up of two essential parts, the energy source and the living cell. The energy source to fuel the cell via the crystallization eroding on its back power unit that, that then transfers the energy fuel into the living cell. The flow of fuel travels from the energy crystals through the fuel strands feeding into the cell, energizing the metabolism unit while simultaneously assisting the figure to release the heavy weight it's carrying, that is the emotion that it has been collecting throughout the day. This corpuscle behavior aims to sustain the living cell and preserve it in longer than its average lifespan by collecting the emotions and converting them into energy to be stored for when the cell starts to decay. These dwelling units are macro units that make up the macro system of the cosmos. Each dwelling unit is a module that interlock with other unit to create a kit of part habitat. When the feral figure decays, the dwelling unit follows suit, and then it replaced with a newly mutated module to ensure stability in the feral society. The legacy of these feral creatures and dwelling remain as an integral part of these planets. Studies of excavation processes expose the remains of the feral figure and its resting place. As the layers of the ground are stripped away layer by layer, we start to reveal the formation of the King Tut of the Interstellar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, beautiful visuals, and I love how you're tying all the story together, like with emotions. And again, like you know, we can envision like what is happening inside and the the function of uh, each part. I'm uh, wondering, you know, like uh, for you guys, like how you know you proceed, like in the next uh, chapters, like uh, what opportunities you're going to see also, like as the, this like public interactions and spaces uh, to continue those. Um, you know, like very interesting storytelling and uh, the visualization that like you are carrying through like all these chapters. I think that it's uh, very nice put together and uh, tied together. And uh, I feel that like again, like for the amalgamation part, uh, there are opportunities again, like to, you know, create these aggregations in a meaningful way, like uh, moving forward. Thank you. Apologies that I, uh, unfortunately, it seems like I joined in in the middle of the presentation because, uh, apologies, it was a bit late in uh, in Tehran, 
and I had to say uh, I had to say goodbye to some of my uh, with the staff in my play uh, in the office. So I kind of missed. I kind of joined in in the middle. Uh, so I it would be very difficult for me to make any uh, I think a very meaningful comment. The overall I think the presentation looks absolutely amazing. It was very. Uh, it reminds me of um, uh, Neri Oxman, you know, the simulation that uh, she works into like uh, using uh, this biology as a growth system that it could, you know, mutate the graphics. It looks amazing, but unfortunately, as I said, I joined in in the middle. So regarding the storytelling, I'm not sure if I followed it uh, completely. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alejandro, Alejandro, we cannot hear you. Sorry, your voice is really far. Can you hear me better now? A little bit better. I'll try to speak up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was going to say, like, I, I like the the visuals and the kind of dualism between the two materials. Like I kind of like that they kind of represent in a way like an object inside and then the other one so they're wrapping it up. And it's, it was always this condition of the in between yeah, of like a kind of interstitial spaces, like a, the kind of like what happened in between the external and the, in, in, in the internal condition, like this kind of edge, what happened if you can inhabit it. I think still like in terms of the section, like it could have been richer. Like uh, when I see here the, perspe the perspective section, like I think that kind of constant width would have been something a bit more playful. And then like I think as we discuss uh, at some point, like it could have been quite interesting to see how some of these cavities, like you can access them like from a very tight uh, area or kind of like when you are navigating, let's say your envelope, you all of a sudden have these cavities, like it's almost like caves that you can access them and then they open up and it, it kind of creates all these in between spaces. I think that's the part that I'm a bit like missing out here. Like I think like the, the project is very well presented and you know like the, the images are very well put together. Just that kind of in between spaces, I think was a quality that uh, it was there at some point. It was kind of getting shaped, but somehow like it didn't get that uh, presence uh, at the end of the final image. So I don't know if like when you develop this for when you like you're going to have to like kind of uh, simplify the geometry as you go to the next chapter. It would be good like if you could have a bit of an essence of that in between on yeah. the abstraction of your of your object. So I'm that saving you, some of those. Saving some of them for the next. Stay tuned yeah, for the yeah. next chapter. Save some of them for the next. I think I think when when you abstract your object, I think that's a quality the in between that mm -hmm. like it should sort of come across as well on the on the next chapter. Like I think it, it didn't get the strength that it needed, like to make up like a, a real thing of it. But I you know I think it's something that you guys should explore as you kind of grow in the scale as well. Thank you, Alejandro. Yeah, uh, the visuals look really appealing. I agree with that. And I think the strongest part from your project is the connection between the outer layers and the and the inner inner spaces that you manage to control quite well. As uh, I hope you take it as a constructive criticism, but for me personally, the the material of the of the whole thing it's too similar to actual tissue, so it's hard not to see the whole thing as a, an actual heart or some kind of an organ. So for me, that's for me personally, that's that's not uh, an advantage for the project. And also the the texture, the red texture and the material doesn't go quite well with this subtle pattern that you managed to do parametrically the rings. It, they, the two patterns feel really Far away from each other and like uh, they they don't blend so naturally. So I hope you can 
push this further in the next chapters that overall overall your progress was, was quite good and the results the results are here so you should be glad with your with your uh, results so far yeah thank you yeah i'll you, second that i also second that uh, last comment um uh even though i joined a little bit late uh i appreciate your uh your uh effort on documenting this. Uh, I like the fact that it's kind of vascular, uh, but yeah, definitely you should put more effort onto the skin uh, so it looks more integrated as a pattern, as an overall articulation. Um, it's kind of like very separated now that the, the geometry pattern from the, from the, from the actual texture. So you can definitely find any inventive way of, of dealing with that, I'm sure. But overall, if I yeah. may, uh, if I may intervene, I think uh, I think just a bit, a little bit of a tweak, making the quad into diagrid will solve the problem quite easily. I think. I think the the reason that it doesn't blend the uh, the, the textures, they don't align. I think it's because of the. Uh, it, they just have to shift it to diagrid, and I think it will blend much nicely to the overall geometry. I believe. Thank you. I mean, overall, you can have an explanation as well. It doesn't. It's not about what is the pattern of it. It's how does the pattern relate to the underlying form in a way. Of course. Um, so yeah, I think it's an extra layer on the narrative as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Very good job. Uh, I know it was a tough few weeks for you, but now you managed to go in a very great fashion. So proud of the work and continue pushing for the next chapter. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for the comments. And so we go back to quick A. Thank you guys, uh, thank you John, and pretty lovely presentation and nice visuals. So let's go to A5, Akash and Shivani. Can you hear me? Hello everyone. Hello, hello guys. Okay. Uh, greetings to all and welcome to our chapter 2 Corpusal Ameliorator. I am Shivani Jaswal. And I'm Akash Roger. And together, let us walk you through our story. According to Hindu cosmology, it is said that the entire existence is divided into four yugs, which work in a loop, namely Satyug, Treta, Dwapar, and Kalyug. The yug that is currently going on is Kalyug. Near the end of Kalyug, when the virtues are, are at their worst, a catalysm and re-establishment occur to enter to the next cycle, that is Satyug. Scientists had predicted the end of the world, and they were desperate to find a way to survive. After years of searching, they finally received a response from an alien race. The aliens were willing to allow humans to join their society, but only if they could prove themselves worthy, which is by transferring all of their data and knowledge to the aliens. The humans eagerly accepted the deal, and the aliens began to the process of creating suitable embryos for the human souls to inhabit. These embryos were genetically modified, resulting into body parts which were adapted for land, water and air. They were the ultimate hybrid beings, a combination of birds, fishes and humans. As the new hybrid known as Human 2.0 began to grow and develop, it was a new beginning, a chance to create a perfect world. As the new hybrid settled into their new world, they began to think about how they wanted to live. They imagined grand fluidic castle-like structures with accentuated curves that blended seamlessly with the environment. To make their vision a reality, they began planning their new habitat. The project was complex with multiple stages of development, but they were determined to create a world that was beautiful and sustainable. The hybrids were proud of their unique advanced bodies and were excited to use them to create a new, better habitat for themselves. 
something they could relate to. One of the most innovative body part of the prosthesis was the shoulder structure, which was featured as a petal pods of the corpuscle. These petal pods were designed to both to both functionally and aesthetically pleasing and were inspired by the lotus flower, which is often associated with purity, rebirth and strength. Petal pods were connected through a network of stretch membranes, much like the stretch wings of Human 2.0. The idea of Voronoi running the prosthesis was also followed in the corpuscle, enveloping the stretch membrane in order to give an organic touch. The bony white material of the prosthesis skeleton was used throughout the corpuscle. The fluidic wallet bulbs of Human 2.0 were an inspiration for the glossy strokes on the petals. Resembling the innermost layer, bioluminescent veins covered the outer surface of petal pods. The hybrid began to design and build the corpuscle, which is made up of interconnected petal shaped pods. These pods consist of private spaces like resting dorms and hallways, as well as working spaces like laboratories and workshops. The pods are connected through a network and linked to two nodes and contain meditation chambers. This also allows the processes to easily transit within the corpuscle. And now we unveil to you the ameliorator. It serves a habitat for approximately 15 people. This corpuscle is enhanced by bioluminescent wings, which add to its beauty and visual appeal. The hybrids are struck by the variety of shapes, textures, and shades of that the corpuscle offers, and the range of views from different depths and distances. They are delighted by the unique and immersive sensory experience that the corpuscle provides. From the top view, we can observe the pods and the nodes are interconnected. The meditation chamber shows the weaving of the component from floor to the wall and the roof. With a subtle immersive light washing the folds, the interior of the spaces are all white, symbolizing peace and spirituality. The inside of the petal pods becomes the laboratory for research and development of the species. Where the external veins also grow inside to light the interiors with the illuminating folds, the labs become a hub to experiment materials and construction methods for the new world. The furniture is also inspired by the processes and the corpuses itself and follows the same style. The seatings extend out of the form. Furthermore, in the perspective plan, the corpuscle offers laboratory along with the landing pad and the stargazing deck. On the top, amongst the layer of vegetation, the stargazing deck is located. This is where the hybrid enjoys the view of the aurora, which naturally occurs in the environment. The corpuscle consists of Vorona extensions that allows it to amalgamate with other corpuscles in all possible directions. The hybrid continues to thrive in the new, in the new corpuscle, enjoying all the unique and immersive features it offers. They reflect on their journey to create this new habitat and look at the future with optimism and hope, knowing that their new home will provide them with fulfilling and happy life. Thank, Thank you. you. OK. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, just keep it like very short from my side. And we give time to our guests. Uh, I think in general, like uh, you, you managed to articulate. You know, like I, I thought, like when we left it, I was a bit concerned about the articulation of the different elements. I think you managed to reach a very good state. And the interiors, I think, they are very well developed. Like uh, I would like to commend you for them. Like I think they are very exciting, very fluid. Uh, they are, you know, like um, subtle enough, but then it kind of brings the, the movement. Uh, it is somehow uh, 
tighten to some of the elements that we discussed before. My only concern, uh, it's always been the sticks. Like, uh, like I think the sticks, uh, I'm, I'm now convinced, like I kind of, my comments were from there from the first week, but I would say that the, the connections of the, how do you call them, the, the, the fluid bulbs, like these kind of flowery elements, they are great. They were always great. The pattern came along well. Like I think it's it's, it's good how it's working. But then the sticks is just not natural the way they are they are connected. Like you know, like it's it's always like if you see there's that image, uh, there's that one image that you have on elevation. I think it's the one that you have on the screen. No, that's a section. But then there's an image uh, when you have these arrows going in a circle. There's an image that you see like it's clearly like in the flower, like basically like right in the middle, you have this kind of stick coming through the center. And it's just for me not, not natural the way that these things comes uh, into the composition. So I think like that's something especially for the next chapter where you're kind of going to start adding more and more connections that you need to be careful on trying to articulate the connections as an integrated part of your design. I think that's uh, that's what I will I will kind of suggest. I know like you know you always wanted to have those connections, but like it's I think would have been a lot more successful if somehow you will feel like the petals were like naturally like kind of creating those connections. I think that's but we've discussed that already. I think it's just more like towards the next chapter. Uh, it's something to to keep in mind because you will have more and more connections. But great, great stuff, guys. And I think like you you pull it all together and it's very well presented as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to strengthen all the positive comments from Alejandro. I think the overall composition is really nice and the aesthetics is there and you present it in, in, in a really nice way. Um, as some as for some criticism, I think you are lacking some precision to the geometry because you kind of lost control on it relatively early in the process, and you were dependent on uh, fixing this this uh, loss of control in in uh, with ZBrush later. So that that left a mark on the overall geometry. It looks nice, but if you look close to it, you can see some lack of precision in the geometry. So that's one thing. And the other is about just the visualization. I think those trees that you just photoshopped there are really not not convincing. So those are my overall comments. Can you um okay um first of all guys thank you very much uh, from the very beginning you mentioned the soul embryo and the the concept that uh, they will be with the help of the aliens they will be human 2.0 uh, i just want to say that there is a book called life 3.0 by max tegmark and it's about the how to being a human in the age of artificial intelligence i would recommend that uh, uh, to read about it and I think it might help you a lot to uh, kind of concrete your idea in a more articulated way. Regarding the uh, the design process, I think uh, I noticed that some of the groups they were using like a shaded mode of Rhino. I, may I suggest that uh, let's not use that in a sense because we all because everybody of course, uh, everybody here is an architect or designer and we all work with these tools, but I think we could uh, skip that part and rather than showing the, the result, the initial result, I think it would be better to skip to the part that uh, we, let's not see like what medium that you're using. And the I really like the idea of the furniture. It was quite interesting that you were trying to use the petal and then try to make it a very um, a very realistic, let's say, uh, sort of, uh, yes, for the chair. How, but the thing is that uh, the, the composition or the design repertoire of the furniture with the, with the entire interior or the colony, 
I mean, the, uh, the connection was not there. I mean, I can see that with the chair and the cluster of chair, it works with the ceiling lamp. But for example, uh, when it goes to the entire uh, part of the, inter uh, the, inter the interior, the colony, it's not there. And the coffee table, I don't think once, I mean, in this universe that we are um, uh, envisaging, I don't think that the people, they will go for coffee. I think we should have to follow BB. I mean, we have to speculate on a different sort of a liquid to rejuvenate or do something better. And I think for the mushroom guilds, uh, I think you could work more more onto that and try to give more definition, more performance into it. I think uh, since you are using that definition in order to show, uh, such as, I don't know, condensing the air, make it like to basically make the, uh, purify the water or something. I think it could work uh, much better. Uh, and I think rather than using a purple black side, you could use a different one because it, yeah, um, uh, I think it would be, it, it, it would again enhance your concept because as of now, making it black, it would make it a little bit scary in the sense that and it doesn't over uh, makes it a bit overwhelmed with the entire system. But overall, it was quite interesting and I hope that uh, in the future you could manage to harness all these uh, forms together in a more holistic way so that uh, it would look more enchanting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's like um, got some really good comments. Uh, thank you guys like for mentioning everything. I think that like all of them are on point. Um, yeah, for me, the most important part is again, like, you know, being consistent with the fully full immersion of the story and like exactly like thinking about like different aspects of this future, right? Like and how it would be different, right? So um, and that's one opportunity and the other one definitely like keep uh, you know like uh, growing your skills on uh, modeling and design and now you're going to have like more uh, you know like knowledge with computational design especially like grasshopper and um, to create your amalgamations but uh, yeah try to keep like models as clean as possible because then you know like it, it transcends and it carries over and uh, since like we as Arian uh, like was actually mentioning like you know we're all uh, designers here so you know like it's uh, something like evident so something to keep in mind and you know like an opportunity for growth but I think that you guys are really you know like learning and you're pushing yourselves and uh, you're trying very hard and I think that this like growth it's really uh, evident so thank you so much for doing that and uh, you know like uh, keep going. Thank you. Thank you guys and I really love the progress that you continuously make like uh, th there is a huge progress as I said today as well like uh, till the last day they did their uh, best and pushed up to their maximum so I really appreciate that and uh, the project came really well so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Let's move um, to group B. Yeah. B5, Uka. Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, here we go. Um, hey, my name is Luca. I'm a German architect based in Barcelona where I currently study, and I'm also in um, trying to become a, a space station designer apparently <laughs> and today I'd like to to take you to outer space to the colony S2001 HAL4. Once upon a time in a far off corner of the solar system a group of humans had established a space colony near a large asteroid in the midst of a field of similar celestial bodies. In the space colony, the inhabitants have made the transition from fully biological beings to cyborgs, blending technology with their organic bodies to enhance their physical and mental capabilities. 
The beings of this space colony are hardy and resourceful people, skilled at adapting to the challenges of life in a harsh and unforgiving environment. They're also skilled miners using their advanced technologies to extract valuable materials and other resources from the asteroids in the field. They frequently deploy missions to the asteroids using specialized chips and equipment to extract the valuable resources they need to sustain their colony. They live in an interconnected space station where they have mastered the use of force field technology to protect themselves from the harsh environment of space. The space station itself is a marvel of engineering with interconnected modules housing everything the beings need to live and thrive. Connector tubes are used for circulation between the different spaces inside as well as outside where they allow vehicles to enter and exit. The station is powered by advanced energy systems that harness the energy of mined minerals, and it is equipped with state-of-the-art facilities for research, manufacturing, and communication. The flowing energy is visible everywhere in, around, in and around the station, powering the force fields and interior technology. Despite the challenges they face, the cyborgs of the colony are optimistic about their future. They believe that with their advanced technologies and determination, they can build a better future for themselves and for all of humanity. They use a cleverly designed aggregation system with modular building components. These make it possible for the city and space to continuously grow and expand. Large community clusters connect the different private corpuscles and create a diverse environment. The blue stripes are the energy highways of the space station, which connect and power the different force fields as well as interior technology. A energy infused shell has uh, proven to be an effective protection layer against occasional asteroid strikes. The force field emitter technology is the heart of the colony and separates the inside spaces from the outside environment. The colony is a bustling hub of activity and community with people going about their daily tasks in private and communal areas in order to maintain the various systems that keep the asteroid habitat running smoothly. All parts of the space station are integrated into the powered skin. It is a two-folded world where the inside layers differ highly from the outside. Despite their advanced abilities, the cyborgs were not immune to the dangers of life in the asteroid field. The colony was constantly beset by asteroid showers and other hazards that threatened to damage their home and put the lives of the inhabitants at risk. But the cyborgs were nothing if not resourceful, and they always found a way to overcome these challenges and keep the colony running smoothly. And though they had given up much of their humanity in order to survive in space, they had gained so much more in return. The ability to live and thrive in a place that would have been inhospitable to ordinary humans. Thank you. So, cool. yeah. Good presentation. Uh, hi, Luca. Um, no, I just want to just want to say like um, I think like it's like a great great development. Where I think like uh, you know like you kind of brought that. Uh, you know, I think like you kind of preserve like the mass stripping strategy, which I thought like always like that was the, the right direction for this. But then like you came up with this uh, tiling pattern that is not so, you know, it's not so obvious, like, and it's kind of working very well with your uh, hexagonal, kind of the other part, right? Like the hexagonal pattern that is sort of like dissolving. I think like uh, the two, the two, the combination of the two elements, especially that image that you have now, like I think it's super strong, like uh, very aesthetically pleasing, I would say. Uh, I think like the, um, you know, like the 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 one thing like to like you know, if we were if we were to spend more time on this, like I will now sort of rewind and then kind of like try to think a bit more on the low poly. And then see what what other kind of like um, what what kind of other exploration we can bring in here, other than this kind of like tubular minimal surface, like with same openings or same type of openings everywhere. Like maybe there is like further explorations or further situations that you could try to force your geometry to 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 kind of like. Um, 
let's say like you know create like different spaces like when i think about the space that your geography creates that you have this condition that you have a bigger opening for the entrance and then you have the, the kind of like a kind of like tubular thing that then connects into other elements but i'm sure like there's a lot of a lot of potential on things to explore that maybe it's something to keep in mind for the next chapter like i don't know what's going to be your abstraction of this i think Definitely, like you have a strong language for like the, you know, like the detailing of it, like I think it came across very well. But I th I'm just thinking like, you know, what, what is the abstraction of your module? Or like what are the potential modules that you want to have for the next chapter? It might be that you have one module that creates some sort of like, kind of like it connects to itself. So it's kind of a closed loop with things happening. And then you have other ones that are a bit more like kind of funny and branching out. So you have those two elements that then will create like a further richer articulation for the next chapter. Uh, yeah, like um, like super super pleased with the with the final outcomes. You did a great job, and you should be very proud as well. Thank you. Beautiful work, Look, um, I think that it has come a long way, a lot of learning in chapter two, but like you've implemented so many details, like you were true to your designs, like there was a lot of, um, you know, like great opportunities here, like to learn and I love like how you also, you know, like told the story and uh, all the visuals that come with it. What I would love to see more, it's uh, some more like differentiation maybe between the spaces and a little bit like more about like the story of like, you know, just having these spaces that are a little bit like, um, you know, unique or different according to function, right? Like uh, within the core puzzle. But I think that even like moving forward, like building like more and more of the story, there are going to be like more aspects of that, like just to think that then like about the public aspect, how people are actually like coming together what kind of spaces like how do they look like uh, is there you know like uh, opportunity like for any kind of like uh, floating elements or you know like again like how do you actually like move uh, through the space and how do you differentiate it and just create like more experiences uh, but other than that I think that like it's a uh, beautiful work so thank you uh -huh. I'm going to say that uh, overall, I really, I really love your project and there are a few things that I really admire, like uh, the way the fact that you stick with your own language in your approach. I, I really uh, respect that and it was nice to see that you managed to pull all that out uh, with an algorithmic approach from start to end. Uh, and uh, I also really appreciate the artistic way you did your visualization. I think they they bring a lot to the overall design and the presentation. And uh, other than that, there are many other positive uh, qualities to your design that the others already said. So good job. Thanks. Uh, hello. Um, thanks for the presentation and I like the use how for the, you know, have a little bit of a, a pop culture reference from this space Odyssey. It was, it was interesting, but uh, apart from that, I, what I found it more interesting was that you used minimal surface as a medium to use it as a habitat. And I think in a place where there is no gravity, or at least I, 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 I assume there is no gravity, I think uh, this would be a very nice solution in order to maximize the performance of the space, making it into a hyper performance space. So what I would recommend is that if you could ex, um, ex, uh, you, um, explore basically the possibilities of, for example, make some flows of the gravity line and then kind of differentiate that by the time like you are moving from one vector like x and y from one axis into the like uh, x and z and then uh, y and z axis uh, the different sea planes uh, how the different types of spaces it could uh, how the the inhabitants of that of that spaceship of, of or that colony uh, what type of spaces do they have or how does the like different types of orientation of these pieces together would work? Uh, in regard of your um, aggregation and road system, I would recommend that um, you make it a 
if you if you if you go to the, to those diagrams, um, I think you could make some simple, uh, very simple diagrammatic growth system like using fractals, uh, or linear or cross or yes, uh, I think you could make it a, a rather than. You have already used a very complex. Uh, you have like there are amalgamation of many of these pieces together, but perhaps you could simplify that. You could simplify it, and you you could just stick with some simple rules, and then by the third or fourth iteration, you start making a very complex iteration that it could go together, creating this labyrinth of spaces. Uh, I would recommend that. And the um, one last thing as a compliment: the surface treatment. Uh, uh, this Maori face tattoo effect. It was it 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 worked quite uh, very very interesting, and the patterns that go in between them. Uh, it was it was very uh, like you you brought some uh, beauty into it. So thank you for that. It was it was quite interesting to see this as a uh, on the overall uh, fascia of this uh, minimal surface. So very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Oka. Thanks for all the positive comments. Great progress for the past few weeks. And uh, yeah, I can you know, work with the positive comments. Thank you for the clear job and looking forward for our attention. Uh, now we want to. Eight. Okay, next we have Kate and Oscar. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. okay. So we are Kate and Oscar, and we're presenting the Angenome project. Let us welcome you all into our flourishing world. Our story is happening in the not so distant future on the very same Earth as you are on right now. In the search for alternative energy source, we made a discovery, a new genus of plants known as symbiophytes that grow directly in connection with the human body. Symbiophytes attach and grow from humans once we pass on. Some have a stronger coupling with symbiophytes than others, enabling incredible structures to be built. We call those people engines, vessels through which the symbiophytes get the energy to grow our new environments. Together, the engines and symbiophytes have enabled us to reshape our environment and now provide us with the means necessary for survival of our society. This ushered the era of beautiful coexistence between us and symbiophytes. Maybe it's time for us to present ourselves. We are the bioengineers, or as we often called, the rooters, because we work within the underground root systems. Our task is to understand genetic coupling between the symbiophytes and angions. We also conduct experiments to try and improve or modify the symbiophytes. Last time we met, we presented our Gen 8 prosthesis. With this multi layer breakthrough, we managed to reach a stable symbiosis and create an all season adaptable prosthesis. Today, we'll be familiarizing you with the next chapter of the Angenome project, the core puzzle. Once we found the symbiophytes, we started developing our habitat around them. We experimented with multiple different ways of merging the mechanical structures with the living organism, but in the end, it always had to have a will of its own. The initial research led us to two units. Firstly, the L unit, a space is designed as the living and laboratories where we conduct research experiments. The unit is built as a concrete shell formed around and in conjunction with the symbiophytes. It is the principal living space of the corpuscle. Then comes the mechanical framework built along the expanding root system. It holds all the critical systems necessary, as well as enabling monitoring for the symbiophyte health. Under this, there is a system of root, root vegetation, the living part of the symbiophyte. Together with the angions, this organism keeps evolving, adapting to the environment around it. Finally, our laboratories, where we conduct our experiments on the genio of the symbiophytes. These inflated glass nodes are held in and bound by the symbiophyte structure. Next, we have what we call the ECOR energy source. Firstly, it's made up of hardware layer, mechanical parts that assist in harnessing the energy created by symbiophytes. Secondly, we designed energy nodes. The energy accumulates there and can be used as an emergency power source during high demand situations. Next, it's scrap symbiophytes, the core of the power source. 
those roots are active and producing energy that can later be transported to living units. Finally, the transmutation elder. This is vessel for the symbiosis. On the elder, the angions and symbiophytes join inseparably, transmuting into the core of the E unit. It functions as an energy source for the root structure to grow. It serves both as infrastructural facility as well as ritual space, where rooters are remembered. There is a specific way of how symbiotic links work. The engines in connection with symbiophytes constitute the energy source of the corpuscle. Once the engine passes on, the symbiophyte keeps growing and extending to form structures that are capable of uh, housing the rooters. Another type of interaction with the symbiophyte is through adaptable facade. With the feedback from environment, be it humidity, heat, uh, we can alter the facade. Uh, there is a set of openings from ranging from fully opened to completely closed. As previously mentioned, the course the corpuscle is made up of two components, the living units and the energy cords. Each core can be attached to multiple living units and power them. The connection type is determined through the alpha angle. This leads to three primary states of connection, bivalent, trivalent, and tetravalent, with a number of living units as the indicator of the valence of the connection. To get the proper visualization of the corpuscle, let us walk you through the section views. Here you can see how exactly the corpuscle is structured. A living spaces are set inside the symbiotic symbiophyte roots with numerous passages that vector our ways to labs that in glass notes. The adaptable facade covers the corpuscle to let light and air through the shell. Roots and vegetation enable growth of the units. This layer wraps around a mechanical framework that monitors the symbiophyte's health. The corpuscle has many ways of integrating into its environment. It was designed as a part of a sustainable ecosystem. As such, the system can be planted even in deserted areas and grow them back to prosperity. To accomplish this goal, we have had to work diligently in our labs. We would just spend most of our time here, inside, where we have access to all the facilities we need for our research experiments. And the inflated glazing provides us with ample light to allow for a strong photosynthesis of the symbiophytes, keeping us and the structure healthy. The furniture we use in the lab was born out of non-stop testing on the controlled growth of these symbiophytes. This is interior of our common space. It's our off-duty venue. It's completely adaptable. The facade can be adjusted to keep the root structure and inhabitants healthy, most through exposure to sun and air baths. Along with the facade, the furniture system is also adaptable. Furniture parts are integrated into the corpuscle shell. Furniture armatures grows once the pots are activated, and then a coating layer is added. To keep the symbiosis stable, we're constantly working and improving on our developments. To keep we keep testing and monitoring the compatibility between engine symbiophytes and bio implants of our prothesis. All in service of those of us who have already passed on and transmuted into the structure and now provide us with vital energy, ensuring our survival and growth. As you can see, our habitat and environment are flourishing due to this complete symbiosis. We are regrowing our world in an era of wonderful coexistence between us and symbiophytes. Thank you. Thank you guys, uh, such a wonderful project, uh, you know, like it just, I think it's like one of the most, again, like cohesive projects from beginning to end. It doesn't even feel like that, uh, you know, like we've left like, uh, you know, uh, mid journey at all from the beginning. Uh, it just looks so cohesive, so beautiful. I love like how you're thinking about every aspect of the story, the patterns again, like they, they do have like their purpose, they're embedded into the storyline, uh, each of the furniture. But I think it's uh, really applaudable, like what you guys like did, everything is beautiful, but these interiors really like it just, 
uh, we couldn't believe it when we saw like what you guys like really like accomplished with the interiors and how like they look generated they don't look like that you actually were the designers of them uh they look that good you know like we couldn't like say that that's you know that's not an ai that's you guys and i think that that's really commendable i feel that there are so many opportunities going into the next layers and next chapters you set up like yourselves for great success with all these like different units different you know aspects of the design because you have like such a strong storyline such a strong design language that it's uh, going to like for me like there are just so many opportunities like to unlock you know like the the, the bigger scale and the community and see how these you know like interactions are going to come to life but really huge congratulations from my side really well done thank you thank, thank you very much yeah, I just say, uh, I think Pavlina pretty much said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> but yeah, in general, guys, uh, what I would say is like uh, your your project is uh, super, super consistent. Um, I think like, you know, like everything sort of makes sense. Uh, don't know how you guys managed to achieve it because there's so many layers of information, but yet everything is kind of like in kind of interconnected and like at the same time, like like uh, connected to the meaning that uh, you brought from the thesis. So like from, you know, from the multi-layering and all the different elements that uh, they are there in your diagrams and they are there in your in your images to the way you are kind of treating each of each of them. Like I, I really like uh, your, your patterning and how the patterning is sort of like the same topologies responding to different aspects that you have. I think you have also like, you know, like the, in terms of the, the topology of the geometry itself, it has so much potential as well for the, for the connections uh, to, to the other components in the, in the next phase. And yeah, just in general, like the, both the detailing in the external uh, envelope and like the, the, the internal shots are just like stunning. So yeah, it's just like big congratulations to you guys. You, you guys like a master it. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I never thought I would say this, but uh, if there is one person that I could refer to this entire presentation, you guys are like Christopher Nolan. To be honest, for the first two minutes, I try to follow but then I totally lost it. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, it was a it was a great show, but I think I need to I need to rewatch it at least two or three more times to try to put this thing together. Uh, I, I never thought that I would see an architectural project like Christopher Nolan style, but the overall the, the consistency of your graphics and visualization, it was perfect. Uh, so I really commend you for that. And the furniture system, it really caught my eye. The fact that it had some pseudo resemblance to the old, to the uh, prehistoric time compared to this new reality and new uh, this future. So it was uh, it was very, very interesting. And, uh, and I hope that uh, once these projects are published somewhere, if I read more into it, especially this one, I would try to understand even better because you guys have used a, a tectonic or multi-layer of uh, information here and each of them would reference into a different timeline or different uh, set of information. I think uh, I would require, uh, yes, I never thought that I would say, but I would need to read more into it so that I could start to interpolate all these scenarios. But the overall, the color coding, it was perfect. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. But I still need time to digest it. We'll try to be clearer next time. We're sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you yeah, present it backward and it would be tenant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that actually Ariane is meaning it as a compliment, you guys. It's just the layers of complexity and thoughtfulness that went into it. It's like, you know, I feel that there's just so much into it that like you could really like, you know, read into and discover and think about and imagine about it. And you're unlocking all these doors, right? Like in this limited amount of like time that you have like to present this. So 
So sorry, Adrian, just like a <laughs> like addition to your comments. <laughs> no, no, it was amazing. No, don't get me wrong. It was not. Uh, it, uh, it was quite very, very, very meticulated set of information, collages, again, mid journey. And I'm uh, and to be honest, I'm very new. I myself, I am very new into this. I never, I, I I admire it from the outside world, but I never thought that architects would really tackle into this thing full on. And I really commend Design Morphin for this because I never thought that. Uh, just out of curiosity, most of the participants are architects. Am I right? Yes. Uh, well, uh, as most of the design. Yes, uh, most of the designers in the master's degree they are architects, but there are also many that are from different disciplines, like uh, fashion designers or um, you know, like industrial designers. Uh, so, like it, there is a diversity, like in the you know backgrounds and also interests uh, of everyone. And I think that that's where you know the program is based on exactly like where they want to take this narrative. So in the concept lab, we started with everyone with uh, AI and mid journey to envision these worlds as a starting point and then, you know, like starting to build them and uh, create like a lot of these, like, um, you know, through computational design strategies, through, you know, like polygon modeling, like in the first chapter and now like uh, venturing more and more into Grasshopper and the next chapter is going to be like even more like of those systems. So, and again, like the, the knowledge that a lot of these students are coming with, or, you know, like the, they're very different levels, very different experiences, very different languages, and they're all from all corners of the world, literally like you know like that's, from asia that's to the beauty actually that is the beauty it's like the globalism into this the design system there's like a new uh, futura Bauhaus that uh, you know back then they said that to put uh, designers and industrialists together here we say that to bring all the design disciplines together with ai and see what magics it will unfold and i can see that it's the uniqueness and the diversity of all these uh, projects is actually says about it and i'm very impressed because again as i said it's my first time witnessing this uh, the deepness and the magnificence of this so yeah congratulations Thank you, thank you, Arian. And I could also say that some actually of the designers and archi uh, like uh, architects might not have like had even the opportunity to work with like three D design softwares before coming to the project. So it's even more, you know, like uh, jaw dropping when you see like these like guys like really working hard and with like the support of everyone really like in the program like uh, to really like uh, you know like nail this and uh, create like these new worlds and new visions. So. Uh, that's like why we're like so proud of these guys. So yeah, we could continue like onto the next project, but thank you for the beautiful comments, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys for pushing your presentation to this level. Like this is just like above the level basically. And I'm holding this layer of complexity and like as Pavlina said, you keep kept us uh, losing ourselves uh, and confusing us if it is your render or the mid journey um, results because they were so nice. I mean, uh, so it's, it's like a really huge success and definitely you put really nice comments for your projects. So just congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Let's move on to Group B. Thanks, guys. Uh, group B, you have B6. Victor, Mauricio, and Emilia. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are Valmira, Victor, and myself, Mauricio, and we are presenting the Sebo, Volume 3. Sabo is a story of love, mystery, vengeance, and rebellion, a story of the eternal conflict of good versus evil. It all begins when Starry, a clone from the year 2914, travels to the year 2403 in order to change the course of the future. His plan is foiled and ultimately it leads to his demise, but not before he falls in love with Kara and they conceive a beautiful baby girl. After he's caught sabotaging the Virta lab, Starry is forced to flee to safety, taking both Kara and the baby with him. During the escape, Starry is killed, but Kara and their daughter escape on his space vessel. In the year 2914, Sabo and her mother crash on planet Earth, her mother dying on impact. Maestro Ido takes Sabo under his wing and protects her as his own. 
As the years and decades passed, society struggled with the many environmental disasters, famine, sea level rise, and global warming. What used to be human comfort is now uninhabitable. Coastal cities have flooded, landlocked cities have scorched in the sun, and humans have been forced to adapt and sustain. Classicism is at its worst, as those living in poverty have been forced to the water, while those in power have modified the human genome. The Virta people leave the flooded cities and build Lumo, the city of light. Tall and white skyscrapers reminiscent of purity and godliness are erected in honor of the demigods the Virta have become. The Maro, on the other hand, have adapted to their water city, Malhela, becoming one with the sea through a blending of mutation and augmentation. Tensions between the Virta and Marhomo people rise up as the Virta enforce their superiority over the Maro, causing an imbalance of power and resources. Our project seeks to explore the characteristics of the Virta faction and procure the ways in which our characters represent their aesthetics, architecture, and design. I protect. Prosthesis uh, character, Hela, is characterized uh, by a mix of uh, technology and organic bones uh, structure. For our mid-journey exploration, we tried to uh, retain those uh, recognizable aspects in exterior, interior, and the furniture. For the corpuscle, we integrate a uh, symbolism that uh, corresponds with the aspiration of the Virta to become gods of themselves, which is why we decided to define uh, three main spaces, uh, big to small, bottom to top, almost uh, like a journey. Our initial models uh, were uh, compositions of a uh, white and pristine element, which uh, could be assembled to form functional spaces a uh, dwelling. Grasshopper was uh, finally used to apply surfaces, uh, details, and textures. The final corpus curl is an epic uh, constellation of uh, three main spaces, each uh, with uh, additional uh, secluded areas uh, and wings uh, to extend uh, the central volume. The space are uh, connected uh, by organic bridges that integrate with the inner structure. Due to these uh, flexible connections, uh, the corpuscle can be aggregated in several distinct ways. We can connect uh, to existing bridges in series, stack multiple bridges at uh, connections uh, for vertical expansion, or use internal structure for integrated uh, connections. The variability of a bridge elements allows for a unique aggregation. The biggest and lowest segment in the functionality diagram is the public space. It connects through a bridge with a smaller private space which further connects to the volume on top, the sacred space. Uh, Victor, you're muted. Yeah. Are <laughs> uh, you still muted? No, <laughs> muted. Excuse me, guys. Yes. All right. The core puzzle is made from three main layers. The dark, <clears throat> excuse me, the dark refined composite protects the inner structures. It is highly durable and resists any wear, wind or rain. Where loads are increasing, vein gold fibers enhance the structural integrity of the material. The inner structures and connections are built from scalar structure. The scalar structure is built as a honeycomb material with small recesses in the surface and helps to improve thermic insulation by staying absolutely lightweight for aerial build. The last layer is the golden gate. It functions as a protection against external intruders and symbol of status. The electromagnetic field it radiates disrupts potential hacking or mind reading attempts of rivaling Vieta or Maro spies. At the entrance section of the private area, we can see how these different materials create a lightweight structure that is open as to minimize weight, but also to allow the flying inhabitants to quickly move between several sections of the core puzzle. Now we want to elaborate on the functions of each space and give you impressions of interior and furniture. 
we design pieces for food and sleep and an altar for the religious aspirations of our prosthesis. In the public space, the Virta can gather and interact on a social level. The main entrance space within the public area of the corpuscle is open. Virta show off their wealth and use the open space to discuss and engage in social activities and politicizing. For more private interactions, the Virta may use either of the more secluded spaces on the upper layers of the public space. In order to move to the next area, one has to fly upwards and enter the bridge connections. Here space for informal gatherings or private chat with a view open to the outside world exists. In the private space, the Virta take care of themselves on two floors. On the lower level, they mix their nutrient solutions and energize on the upper level in their recharge pots. The nutrient solutions are mixed according to the unique genetic code of each Virta. The recharge pots artificially enhance states of sleep for deep and fast recovery. From the private space, we move on to the sacred area. The space is composed of two levels, with a bath in the lower floor for cleansing and purification. The main function is provided by the altar on the upper level. Here, the Virta access the deep state of mind, where they can dwell with unlimited focus and go over hundreds of battle simulations in order to ideally prepare for the upcoming challenges. This was our core puzzle. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, guys. Alejandro, you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> uh, I I think this is like a you know like a, I would just say I would just congratulate you guys. I think like in general, like you you pull it together. I think I uh, there was something always uh, very sexy about your layering in the base model. But then we had that struggle uh, with like how the components come together and the rotation of the components. We went through I don't know how many iterations of all those components together, but I think like uh, the final, you know, like and, and I think this is something you're going to develop more in the next chapter. Like for me, the like the basic unit, like before we start adding these bridges, that's a very successful uh, component in itself. I think the bridges is something that might have been a focus for the next chapter, like as a kind of co connector. So the bridge itself, I would say like, you know, it could be further refined, but then like the, I say like the main component, like that's very well designed. The interiors, uh, I'm very happy with them guys. I guess, I think I gave you a hard time with the interiors. Uh, you, you guys uh, did a great job. Yeah, so I think like, you know, in, in general, I would say like. Like the idea of the multi layer system with these three main components, the kind of articulation, almost like a dinosaur spine of the components and then your interiors like that's a, a kind of made a, a great thesis. So, you know, this chapter does exactly what, uh, what I would expect. And I think like, you know, in terms of the connections like that's that's something that you know you should you should try to think like how like rather than bringing a new element like how can we like bring that multi-layering to to the bridge like right now the bridge is kind of uh you know it's like a kind of a structural trash like uh, with its diagonals and these perforations but like it is lacking a bit on the multi-layer approach the, that you use for the component itself so I think that's just like a minor comment, but in general it's like very well designed. Uh, I like the visuals, it's like a simple, like, a, you know, elegant, like I think they are working very well. I, th I think like there is a, the, the cut -off, kind of patterning that it kind of shows here and there is, is a bit shy, like it's kind of trying to be there, but not sure if he wants to be there or not. It's kind of like a in between, so I don't know if there is some more like bold logic that could be brought into it, but you know, like that image, the kind of golden, how, how you call it, the golden what? What is this? Um, uh, this one or? 
the, on the right, the golden gate. The golden gate. Uh, yeah, so the, I think the, this element is like, you know, very articulated, like so many different elements coming together, very well composed. So well done, guys. Okay, so yeah. from, sorry, go, go, go first. I'm just going to be a quick, I, I agree with everything that Alejandro said. Great, great job, great result. I had a really strong language since the beginning and you managed to pull the result. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but at this point when I see your project, I cannot stop thinking about Homer Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. That's an internal joke here, but yeah. Yeah, good job. I, I know you were thinking too. That's why that's why I wanted to mention that. <laughs> OK. Um. Well, guys, congratulations. It was a, overall, it was a very, a very strong, uh, well articulated story. Uh, I think the, the, at the very beginning, the narrative of the Mauro and Virta uh, uh, facing off the face off and the, even the entire, yes, the selection of the, I think, uh, yeah, even before the Savo, the volume three, even over there, I think it was very, very uh, well crafted. Uh, um just just asking one question this is all generated through ai right so you just sort of made your narrative into it and this is the image that you got am i correct because I'm yeah very we, into this we wrote kind of a comic book of our story so yes, all of the yes. imagery is from the journey yeah yeah but in a sense like uh, it, it is very well crafted as a comic book so I really commend that as if like the story, where does it uh, use like you were very, very artistic uh, as a novelist, as an author to basically craft into this thing. Uh, and I really enjoyed the digital hand sketches. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, it, it, I mean, rather than using just a rhino visualization, you guys used a uh, hand drawing. I thought uh, it was a very, very uh, like an industrial designer, authentic industri uh, industrial design into it. It was very, I really enjoyed it. Uh, when it goes to your volumetric connection manifestation of your the overall design, I think uh, this is something that again the the, uh, the 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 don't get me wrong. The design it looks amazing, but I think the the lack of the inhabitants, the lack of the locals over there, because. It makes it a little bit as an um, like an um, abandoned sort of an spaceship. So I think if you add a little bit of you know with a pinch of uh, adding some humanoid, I noticed that at the at some point you added there, and I wanted to mention that please make them a bit more, give them more contrast to show like how, how their presence would be more manifested compared to the entire interior. Uh, one critic regarding uh, your the, the skin of like if you're going to categorize these different facials of your design, I think the overall uh, the repertoire, the design repertoire, it looks amazing, but the uh, golden uh, hexagon, which is the sort of uh, it's a part of this. Uh, uh, what is it called? I forgot. Catmon Clark subdivision. I think uh, I think that, um, I I don't think that it, it it blends quite well. The yes, exactly the refined composite. I don't think it it kind of blends well with the overall uh, with the overall shells that you are having. But on some other parts, I think with in the other part, I think you use that as a like a sort of an engraving system on the white shell. I think it 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 worked much better. So I would suggest that uh, because. The geometries that you are working here are very more organic and free form and suddenly a very rigid uh, a, a kind, of, kind of a hexagonal grid over there. I'm not sure it blends quite well. The furniture catalog, uh, it was quite, it was very, very interesting. I really like that, uh, th that diagram uh, in a sense. However, I would recommend uh, in order to give it, in order to make its performance more understandable, it would be good if you just again, uh, in some sort of a way, add one humanoid or one of your proposed, uh, let's say, protagonist player into that. 
And uh, one last comment is that I really like your typeface. Uh, again, the story was very quite comic and the typeface that you guys used, it was more of a, it was like a design story to follow. So I really, uh, I got inspired by it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful comments. Thank you, Thank guys, you guys. for <laughs> Just one second, Tom, uh, before yeah. we move forward, just want to say yes, uh, congrats like on the beautiful work, like on, you know, all these different aspects and components that you have created. I think that like um, you guys also like you have this like unique way of, uh, you know, like telling the story that like you're keeping throughout like consistent and it's really uh, unique to your project. It, uh, you know, like brings us up, bring us back like we're like reading a comics. I think you can enhance that even more like throughout the storytelling uh, of the project. And um, I think that again, like this component based design and like we can imagine like how can it can be, you know, like utilized in different chapters and how these components could grow, shrink, like become different kind of, uh, you know, like parts that uh, could be developed in different ways. I also commend you of like thinking about like also like starting to think about like public spaces, right? Like interactions. Um, but uh, I do agree that like the prosthesis, right? Like being a part of like the interiors and exterior spaces, it's, uh, you know, like just elevates the work because like people can just imagine what this like storytelling is. Uh, and you can see like when, you know, like you're starting to rig the body and like place it in different ways, like then, you know, it's just like you have this extra layer um, of like present representation of this project, but beautifully done, uh, amazing teamwork. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, let's move on to group A. Thank you, guys. Let's come to group A to Fatima. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. It's kind of lagging. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, can you see my screen? Yep, yep. Uh, I'm Fatma Farog. I'm an architect and researcher, and this is the Oxymorosa. The Immortalitasology branch, Visionary Vista, and this this is a tale about one of the most timeless quests of the humanoid races, the key to immortality. And this is about a certain species of mutated humanoid jellyfish people, and they are symbiotic interconnected species by nature and can revive themselves from their ashes, or so they thought. Uh, in our tale, it's not so simple, and a hefty price must be paid. Pay, uh, must be paid some. Something of equivalent value must be sacrificed and not just something of equivalent value, but we will see that through our coming chapters. And it's um, and this is uh, the visionary vista, as I was uh, talking about earlier, is where is the setting of this chapter. And um, this is the protagonist, Lithia, one of the visionaries of the transhumanoids uh, living in Bourgogne. And this is uh, like a, a quick overview of what she looks like uh, in her, of what she, like, how she mutates and what parts of, make up her, like, system. And this is her evolution cycle as she goes through her journey to find this key to immortality. And then um, the place where this is all set is Gorgonia, a metropolis of transhumanoids. It's divided into four livable districts. Uh, 
the alphas, the ruling family, you've got the gamma district where the visionaries are, and the beta district and the delta district. And the visionary district, this is how it was, like how it came out, it, uh, or how it was born, was these uh, sketches in this entire process. And this is how this was all, like this is all part of the, how I broke down this uh, entire um, district. And then a quick overview of how this process like moved on to the final form that we can see uh, here. And this is Borgonia, the sprawling transhuman zone metropolis of the abyssal rifts. Sorry. <laughs> this is what one purposeful exterior would look like. And here is a quick uh, spatial breakdown and design functionality diagram showing the different places, pieces that make up this purpose group. We've got the main bibliotorium shard, which is a, a library and observatorium, as well uh, it's connected to this primary research and de development zone. And then it connects through a research feeding tube. And since it's a symbiotic, like organic, um, creature basically, even in the corpus, I mean, it grows and it changes based on uh, the type of research track that's going and how it's developing throughout time. So you've got supplementary research zones like coming out of the main research development zone and the busy form itself. And then we've got like the private tunnels that lead to the re resting zones where they rest and recuperate. And then we've got the most uh, and we've got communal zones because they have to socialize at some point. And um, there, uh, there's also two modes. We've got the ribbed part, which is like for the privacy, and then there's the smaller part, and that's when it's like an NZA basically. So they're protected uh, from like enemy researchers. And then here's when it's more visible. And here's a breakdown of uh, what the systems that make up make that make up this corpus. So we've got the uh, we've got this ribbing system, which is made of, made of uh, a mesoglea tentacle layer that also makes up uh, lithia or the prosthesis itself. Then we've got two types of uh, tentacle networks, like the secondary and the primary one, which connects to the branching system. And then there's the um, then there's the epidermic glass layer, which is the, the almost acts as the glass part of this uh, entire system, and they vary in like. They vary in like uh, thickness and width based on the function that's happening inside. And this is a quick plan. And then we could see in this section or like a cutout how these spaces connect together and how the, they all connect to the main of the uh, bibliotorium shard and then connect to the others, like uh, other zones, the rest in the concrete zone, the com communal zone, and supplementary zone. And then uh, we've also got like this cross section showing how these different types of furniture and like uh how like the spaces are interconnected and stuff and then um speaking of like these spaces let me take you to the interiors uh and this is this is um uh, one of my favorite shots and i call it the moments of rumination and how lithia is pondering her next move to uncover these secrets of medusic uh, immortality and it's a primary research and development uh debriefing zone and then here uh, I call this through the knowledge rabbit hole, where you could see from the library into one of the research pods. And then here we've got the secondary research and development zone. Uh, and you see how like the different furniture type kind of interact because of the no gravity because it's all underwater. And then we've got the inside the bibliotorium's shard forest of flourishing knowledge trees. And here is just a quick take on a quick look on what the furniture looks like. And let me show you that further. So we've got the flourishing knowledge trees, and these are living tentacle bookcases that grow based on the type of knowledge stored inside. And then we've got the expanding pluralis, which is the multiplying plural based seeding units, and these are the varying um, growth patterns. And then there's my favorite, the debrief. It's the chemical neural debriefing board meeting furniture. And here is a quick um, diagram I made for it to show you how it works. So first in stage one, like junior visionaries, they embed into the debrief and upload their progress through the neurochemical signals uh, inside like here. So they place their heads and they're like, and then stage two, the, you've got the neurochemical signals manifesting into plural progress maps over here. And then we've got stage three, which is the primary visionary going over the synthesized progress and reporting accordingly. So this is like Lithia, just like updating them. And um, 
here I could show you some detailed renders of what uh, different connections look like from like other views. And uh, these show like, for example, the main research pod and how it connects to the other research pods and the communal pods, uh, pod, as well as the, the covered ones, like the velvet ones. These are like the most private ones, and that's why they're there's like a variance and hierarchy in the lumen, like the luminance and the transparency. And this is an up close part of the research pod and how it would look like. Uh, uh, how it would look like unrim. And uh, this is a quick also diagram of like more analysis and it shows like how they're connected and how the like if this is the main research development pod, there's this research feeding tube and how the researchers move through different sub research labs from the main research lab and then uh, here's the communal zone I was talking about, and then these are the take a break tunnels, as I'd like to call them, uh, where they go to the communal zones and the rest and recuperate zones with the most private tunnels. So there's hierarchy and privacy in all the different areas. Um, and yeah, this is, and this is Borgonia. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> I can go first. This is good. So just three comments from my side. The first one is the most important. I think Fatma, you need to have more fun. I think like uh, you, I, I can I can feel like uh, or I could feel like in the two weeks we were together that you have this constant struggle. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a, <clears throat> I think we're here to to kind of enjoy the exercise and then that will also show on your final outcome. Like I think, you know, like it's, um, you know, like in general, like it's it's kind of like well structured. You need like what, what you what you wanted to achieve from the beginning. There is like few elements that, um, you know, you, you could potentially like uh, further articulate. And those are my other two comments. Like the, the first one is um, you need to think how the this corpus all is going to connect to the other ones for the next chapter. I feel like at the moment there is a I bit of. Uh, I actually you... kind of for forgot about that. I'm sorry. Okay. It's so, actually so, here. So, so. so yeah, you're right. But yeah, yeah it's important. Yeah. So show us that. Okay, so. OK, but I, I think it's still like kind of limiting by by the same idea, which is like bubbles of different sizes, like let's call it bubbles. I know uh, there's more design and uh, thinking uh, beyond the bubbles themselves. But I think yeah. that that's not necessarily like it's, it doesn't need to kind of keep aggregating as a kind of packing bubble system. Like I think like, you know, you you have you have the um, you have the answer to some of these things like by by your thesis like which is like you have jellyfish uh, yeah. idea and you have tentacles which is like the part that you are kind of missing completely so like right now like i think like we did a lot of sketching where these tentacles had a lot more presence but then at the end in your in your kind of like final image like this tentacle is something very rigid like just coming in one single um, stem. So I think like it, and that, like you have the sketch at some point that was something a bit more fluid and a bit more like kind of uh, underlying structure that will enable all these bubbles to connect in a very clear way. I think that's an important element. So sometimes this, this, these uh, capsules like a uh, will pack and will, you know, will be a very dense area because the population decides to grow more there, but then in some other areas might be a bit more loose. And then the other comment is, um, I think like, you know, you talk about different spaces, different functionalities, but yet the design itself of, especially the external envelope is very monotone. Like it's, uh, they're all the same, like different sizes, but the same. So I think like you, you like especially like one, once you're going to go to the next chapter and these things are going to scale up, like you should find what are the like three, four uh, treatments that are your key functions and then 
you're going to have to detail them in a very distinguished way so that, you know, without the explanation and without all this labeling, like I can understand perfectly that there are four things going on. So, you know, like you, you, you added extra functions, like you, you, you have a lot of functionality, but you should at least have like three, four key different spaces. Like whether they're going from public to private or they're going like, you know, something a bit more tight with your thesis, like that, like a, I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but I think like it would be important that not all the capsules, let's say, uh, have the same treatment. I think that's a, that's a key element. But at the moment, they are all treated uh, like in the interiors, there are different elements, but that's something you differentiated in the interiors and it didn't come across at least yet on the, on the exterior. I think that's a, that's a challenge as well to to kind of like try to find a response to. But yeah, overall, I think that you got a great visuals. Uh, you know, like I'm very happy that you put like, you know, everything together. Like uh, I know you went through a lot of struggles uh, with this, but uh, you know, I think like this focus for the next chapter, my, my, my recommendation will be to kind of identify what, what are the two or three main things to tackle and apply the 80-20 rule, yeah? So yeah. not everything needs to be there. Just focus on the 20% that will give you 80% of the results and have fun with them. And then those are actually going to give you the answers to everything else. So I think like, you know, sometimes like we get into the detail in the nitty gritty of trying to resolve something, but then, you know, like we, we're kind of like forgetting the bigger picture. And I think that you had a bit of that, like uh, when we were modeling and going through the different iterations. So, yeah, good stuff. Congratulations for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Radu, do you want to go? Well, I was I going to say the same thing I did. I think the main, my main concern is you need more differentiation between the geometries because we have really a lot of narrative behind it and not enough uh, differenti differentiation in the geometry to to cover this up. So, yeah, but Alejandro already mentioned that, so I was just want to emphasize. It. Okay. Um, from my side, well, thank you. It was a, overall, it was a well crafted uh, presentation. I like the narrative about the immortality and using the jellyfish metaphor, which is actually they are almost immortal beings. Uh, I think more than a billion year, a hundred million years of evolution, and they are they are still there. Um, the hand sketches and the visuals, I. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was it was quite nice. Uh, there is one artist that I want to give you a reference that you would uh, follow his work. His name is Dominic Harris. When I was in London, uh, I used to follow his work, uh, go to his exhibition in Mayfair. So these are some of his interactive art. I think you could take inspiration from the kind of uh, the the design language and the universe that he creates and those are interactive arts that he um, kind of uses as a main element is in, in his artwork. I would recommend to follow that. It might give you some insights. The uh, and I think that uh, you know from a um, you know in a wide lens when you are looking at your design in a from a distance, it has a very enchanting the color coding and the elements it works. But when we zoom in a little bit, like uh, when I was looking, uh, I think it was with the furniture system, then the connection was lost, I guess. So I think you have to give a little bit of push to try to see, yes, uh, with the polyps and the knowledge tree, I think uh, the design, uh, the, the, the two design system, I think you need to work a bit because th those are two different systems. When you zoom out, it's a it's it's, it's an apple. And then when you zoom in, it's another pink. So I think if you try to massage a little bit, try to fine tune it or find the right balance, I think it would be very interesting. Uh, it, it could basically try to work out. Then there was the debrief uh, in action. I really like that diagrams that you were trying to kind of explain 
which is I think it's a strong point trying to somehow explain that how the inhabitants try to work out together and how does this system would work. I think that was a strong part that you try to explain it. But then again, when it goes with the furniture system, uh, we, we lack these sort of uh, diagrams that says, for example, this person or that person, how they would interact, how that how this would work. So I think uh, you need to kind of in a I know uh, how to say it. Um, let's say that uh, you have on one hand you have a Star Trek and on one and the other you have a Star Wars. I think if you just eliminate one of them and just focus on one story, I think you could make it much more better. I mean, sorry for using those two terms. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I'm not, I know that it's not professional, but I think if you can basically stick to one story and try to basically enhance it and you know, give it more, uh, make it uh, make it more detail into it and use the same narrative within that universe. I think your story would be a very interesting one. Thank you. I'll make choices, but your choices next time. <laughs> yes, make the Sophie choice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Pavlina, we can't hear you. Do you hear me now? Yep. Yes. OK, so yes, I just wanted to emphasize one thing about my I think that um, the most important part that actually like uh, Ale started with, it's very, very important and not just for you, but for uh, everyone in the program, uh, the playfulness, right? Like in just the freedom to explore and to go wild here, it's a key element. So you need to like, you know, a little bit like let go of the seriousness uh, or the expectations like that you guys like might have like from yourselves and really let yourself go and let yourself imagine and just like go wild because that's as you see all the projects that like are you know like have it all in a way like right like all components are there because like there is so much about like this imagination that then transcends into something that like you know like you know like the, the then it's being conveyed to us through these presentations right but before this like imaginative processes and before like this like just taking these decisions about like what are you actually you know like deciding and what is actually important for your project it's um you know like it's always like you know a struggle then so yes my advice would be <laughs> very similar be more playful be more like courageous into like the design decisions you are taking i do see like yes um you know like some decisions that m might be difficult to make like in the next chapters uh, because like it is going Pavlina, you're muted. OK, yes. So yes, uh, basically like uh, that uh, all the particles and like bubbles that are being created, like already like are going into like a larger population, right? Like so it's already like starting to look like amalgamation, but we will work, work through like in the next chapter and just be cautious of that and see like, um, you know, how we can take the next steps. Thank you so much, Padma. Thank you so much. Very good luck. Thank you, Fatma. It's been a great journey, great progress. Thank you, Eva. Um, we have you. two more projects Apologies. to go. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. Will it be okay if I could basically leave because I have to? I have my cousin at my place and I have to take him home, and it's a little <laughs> late here. <laughs> Apologies. So if it's no. okay, I will. Uh, I will leave early a little bit. Uh, Apologies because. Uh, I, did, I, I didn't know that. Will it be OK? I tried yes, to totally connect with fine. my cell phone, but I, uh, given the fact that in Iran the Internet is very, very limited, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can follow that, but I try my best. So, thank you. Thank uh, you so much, Ariane, for joining us. We sure. really appreciate it. Sure. Don't worry about it. Like it's no. totally normal. We're a little bit like already over time, so uh, it's totally understandable. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. Really, really amazing work. And please send me the link to that so that I can watch it. Uh, I, I took I, for each and every project. I took notes. Very, very inspiring and I learned a lot. And thank you for sharing it. Uh, have a lovely time because I, don't, I think you are from around the world. So wherever you are, have a great day or night and hopefully 
uh, I will meet, I will join you for this ne next session to see that how these amazing designs will be developed. Thank you, Ari, and okay. looking forward to Thank that. You. Okay, take care, guys. Bye bye. Hello. Just a second, let me just share the screen. Hopefully, you can see the screen. Yeah, should we start? Yes. OK. So we are Anita and Prashant, and we represent the world of Oz. Oz is a place set in the present time in a different universe where human interaction is not dominant and where diverse animal and plant life forms have been permitted to evolve. It's also known as the outer zone. So our story begins with a young girl named Dahlia who falls through a wormhole and by inadvertently killing the Dark Queen, she sets in motion a series of events that could change the utopian existence of this new world to a dystopian one. Only the wizard can guide Dahlia to reverse her misfortune. So in chapter one, we selected the wizard. We modified his body to incorporate various human changes, which would be facilitated by the environment, as well as his role as a magical being, a warrior, and a protector. In reference to our inspirations, looking to our design journey uh, for the core puzzle, we began with mid journey and we gravitated toward organic structures of stone and earth. Additionally, we took inspiration from the shape of the wizard's spine, and this led to drawings and additional inspirational pictures, which incorporated bulb like structures and features until we arrived at the final variation of the corpuscle in the overall structure seen here in the overall renders. In reference to functionality of the corpuscle, it serves as the nerve center for the community of animal life forms. Each bulb of the corpuscle often contains more than one room. The tall structures include the wizard's lab, the great hall, the wizard's bedroom. The lower structures contain the entrance hallways and the lecture hall of wisdom. The great hall is where the gnomes and other animal creatures come to make requests and have issues resolved by the wizard. The bedroom is the resting chamber of the wizard and the lab is the place where the wizard conjures new brews and magical incantations. The lecture hall is where the wizard gives lectures to the animal community to impart his wisdom on new generations. So the chambers are connected by sky walkways and passages that move between the vertical and horizontal sections throughout the structure and the exterior of the corpuscle is grounded in stone and that becomes an extension of the outdoors. To provide direct and immediate access to the lab, Great Hall and Lecture Hall. The spaces are connected with, the, with a continuous fluid corridor. The core work areas of the corpuscle are, are connected in order to provide easy access to public, semi-public and service areas for the wizard. The corpuscle consists of three key components. The interior enclosure, which is an amalgamation of living and communal spaces. The exterior structure, which acts as an outer protective shell for its inhabitants and an exoskeleton for bridge, provides structural integrity to crystal skywalks. The details show how the skywalks is, skywalk is connected to structure with its exoskeleton. A detail of joinery or connection between two skywalks. A facade detail sweeping over the, on, on the, uh, over on the top of the skywalk. A detail of opening and its transition from interior to exterior on, on one of the vertical spaces. We also explored the possibilities of how two corpuscle units can be connected through various uh, orientations like vertical, horizontal, and a little bit of 3D. We wanted to maintain the fluid design language of the corpuscle, a corpuscle's exterior into interior as well. We aim to design the interiors in a way that gives a sense that the user is, is, is in a continuous space through the walls of the bedroom or the armatures and furniture of lecture hall or great hall and as well as the transitioning spaces such as skywalks. To maintain this sense of continuous and flowing space, we try to maintain the design language 
into the smallest uh, into the minuscule parts of the corpuscle that is furniture keeping the harmony of exterior and interior we took for we, we look forward to welcome you uh, in the harmonious community of gnomes in the next chapter in the world of oz thank you thank you thank you guys uh, okay just like a quick comments from my side i think in general like um, i think you have your design is a bit stiff. That's how I will describe it. Like I think like somehow if you go so capture this image the, that we have on the screen and now go to your furniture and you will see what I mean. I think on your furniture you kind of um, upgrade your game in the treatment. So you have this kind of idea of the looks, but yet you are not playing with them enough. So like when I see the bed, I could see like a much better uh, answer to the openings of what you are offering on the corpuscle itself. When I see the lecture hall seat, I can see, you know, better opportunity than these kind of white stripes, like very flat pattern that you have in your corpuscle. Like here is a lot more articulated. Like even the throne chair by playing with the thickness, of the the edge, like you you kind of achieving like a much more dynamic solution. And now if you go back to your the image where we were before, so here we see uh, you know, the that one yeah. So you see like all the patterns are flat. It's just a kind of flat uh, color pattern rather than a geometrical exercise. You could have. Um, articulated this, you know, in, in a much um, kind of richer, let's say, let's just say like a, it could be a richer way. Yeah, I know like it might be extruded, but even if it's extruded, like the, the whole kind of same thickness, they are all very regular and then they go from a flat end to another flat end, kind of like almost like if you were chopping them. So like you kind of lose that fluidity that you could have uh, achieved by, you know, just playing a bit with the topology and trying to articulate how these patterns navigate through your geometry. Like I, I just feel like, you know, it's kind of different pieces kind of connected by these uh, glass bridges with the with the pattern on top, with the skeleton on top. But I think there's a lot more exploration that you could have tried to, to bring in here. And when it comes to further developing this, I think like that's something to kind of bear in mind to not have, um, you know, when when you start having like patterns that are not uh, offering anything, when you kind of go from the different perspective, they look exactly the same and they don't have this kind of change in thickness and change in width and, you know, change in depth. Like, Every time you are transitioning from one surface to another, it's kind of an opportunity to bring something there. And, you know, like imagine like if you were walking along that pattern is is kind of a walkway that is com completely monotonous. It's like even if you if you were inside and this be becomes like skylights, it will be like kind of constant uh, thickness throughout the entire space. Whereas like, you know, if we are kind of getting closer to the connection points that you articulated here in a different manner with this kind of um, like glass bridges like it could be like maybe the pattern then like it kind of connects back to that and it does something to it like there is you have a lot of opportunities just like i think like there is just like um like you kind of took the shortest path to, to resolve it like with those patterns like other than that the uh, you know the um, the overall shape, I think it has like lots of opportunities for, for the next chapter because you have a lot of orientations. But I would like to see how these uh, white stripes become geometry. Like, you know, we shouldn't need to change the color to, to, to give them a presence. Like it should be like, you know, very obvious. And then you can see it in a lot of, uh, you know, Saha 
and maybe build views. Like how these ribbons become like, you know, a very nice feature to play with them. You just like, you are so constrained here by, you know, your loops were connecting point to point, and then you could have changed the topology and try to further articulate that. But then you just took those loops and then kind of dividing it equal, equally, like which kind of, for me, it's just like, a, like it's the wrong answer because there is no, you know, there is no interest. Like it might, it might as well have been just solid, like than one color. Like I think like that's that's something that you you should try to, you should try to improve. Like let's say. Especially, okay, I'm just concerned. Just concerned when it comes to the next chapter. Like, uh, you understand? Know, like, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for me, I'm really glad that you guys tried different techniques and you managed to apply them in your design. Uh, overall, overall result uh, is okay. I think it has a lot of potential if you work on all those things that Alejandro mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure in, at which point the whole geometry got so thick. I think it was more elegant in the beginning and in some point you must have uh, offset the whole thing outwards and I think uh, the design lost some of its elegancy out of it because the volumes got uh, a bit uh, thicker and um, yeah. And uh, also I, I agree about the comments that uh, rectangular square uh, bridge pattern that you try to apply that could be more organic with the overall geometry uh, and yeah also I totally agree about the stripes and materializing those stripes could be in a more organic way so yeah okay I thank you thank you we'll try to work on that great comments um, definitely like I think that we're all in agreement with the stripes um, they do remind a little bit of Adidas, you know, like uh, an Adidas building. So you want to like definitely, you know, like uh, go towards a different direction when there are such connotations. Um, but that's an easy fix, right? Like, so I'm not worried about that, uh, you guys. I know that like we've had a lot of conversations about materiality and I think that like you made the right choice on to display and present the work uh, on that stage as it is. But uh, then like I think that like coming into the next chapter, we would like to see some options uh, like on materiality, like and you're really venturing in because also we know you can do it. You've proven it in chapter one. It was such a successful you know, like work uh, and such gorgeous work like on the material that I think that it just like a, a matter of like a little bit like push and just look into what's best then like for the more architectural entities and that you're going to be developing throughout the program. So yes, uh, thank you for, you know, like uh, learning and uh, bettering each other and uh, collaborating. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting next chapter. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, it was a start of a journey. <laughs> Three more chapters to go, but I think uh, you guys like, did a, a good job and you can always improve on the work that you did. I mean, in, in the end, you can see other improvements on the furniture in the last few weeks. So I definitely think you guys can, and you, and you also have the opportunity to go back in it. Uh, do some of the comments from uh, from Hina Ratu and Thanks, thanks for pushing us too. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. It's up and uh, yeah, we can go on to the next job. Now, in A. Yes. Finally, the last Fine. presentation. <laughs> <laughs> then you can all enjoy your Saturday, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Yes, do you see my screen? Yes, just one more thing. Okay, okay, okay. Hi everyone, and for those who don't know me, I am Bernie Giril, and I am French graphic designer and art director, mostly working in advertising. So let's go. <laughs> um, okay, okay, post-natural. 
Postnatural is a dystopian and futuristic adventure. In postnatural, we are going back to materials and spaces that can be occupied and that get that can be occupied and that haven't been occupied by the human. Spaces like wounds on Earth or, or, or on never seen landscapes on another planet. In post-natural and in this one of a kind, corpuscule leaves a fantastical beast that is made from waste materials from the industrial era. This beast has a melanin which glass armor and and an exoskeleton made from bone and gold that enables energy transfer. It looks like it looks looks like a flower sculpted in metal. There is also a bubble energy that enables the body to levitate. As I said, this beast lives in a city and in a world that we have never seen before. Post post natural post natural is a grown city and a nature centric eco niche home to mammals, birds, fish, fungi, and trees. In post natural we offer a circular timeline where the past is re-embodied in the future. The old city becomes a fossil on top of which a new cycle of humanity is built. And as it's a grown city, the design process has to be one, and I would like to show you a bit of it. It is interesting to see how a mid Art reminds me some friend, um, some uh, Matisse painting. And on the left is my first design, and on the right the final version. So what happened in between? As it's a grown corpuscule, I came up with this idea of an exoskeleton that is that is the main foundation of the corpuscule. It is inspired by animals, animal schools. It is in itself a super intelligent being. It keeps growing to become a livable space. And it grows and fossilized over a private unit that keeps growing itself. And all of this needs energy that is stored and made within the corpuscle itself, with the bubble energy storage. So this is the final version. This is how I came up with this uh, corpuscle. As I said, um, the process is, is a reclaimed creator. So the corpuscle is forked as a sustainable st station. First of all, the exoskeleton, exoskeleton is a public space and is made from bone and fossilized materials. It grows over the living unit and, and connects it to the rest of the environment. The private space is made from recycled materials from the industrial era. It has two different skin layers. The energy store is inflated glass that ensures there's enough power for the energy reservoir heating and for water decontamination system. And finally, the energy transfer network is made of gold, one of the most powerful materials in nature. It connects the entire um, corpuscle. Let's take a deep look um, at the materiality of this corpuscle. On the exoskeleton, we have a solar panel that absorb UV radiation, converting it into sugar and other nutrients. On the private space unit, we have two kinds of layers. The first one is an iron skin, an organic composite which in chlorophyll and iron safeguards of the living space, living space of the of the corpuscle. And the second one, the second one is made from alufit, which has a, a sanity control function. Alufit is a plant that can be grown in harsh environment. Finally, the energy storage are inflated glasses that enable the corpuscle to levitate, but the main idea is to, is to be self-sufficient in energy. Let's take a look at the area of this corpuscle and focus on first hair, hair purification and water decontamination. The air purification Purification area collects air from the outside, traps pollen, and then the collects trash and clean the, pollen, uh, the contaminated air. The water, the, uh, the water decontamination is possible with the energy storage bubbles. Polluted water is collected from the rain and from the outside and desalinated with the help of wave energy. 
The two main anteriors of the corpuscle are the hanging garden in the in the exoskeleton and the religious monument. The hanging garden is an Eden. It is a nature park with the aim of raising the quality of life by enhancing the flora in the corpuscle. It is the, the home of birds, mammals, plants and trees. The religious monument is a sanctuary. Human being has praised God since the beginning of its adventure on Earth. This time, this time, nature is centric. Trees and plants are God's like. It is a peaceful place. In this environment, we have artifacts such as fossilized book, an ocean wave stable that reminds us of the beauty of oceans, sculpted trees, fossilized vase, and table of waste, a table made from waste and minerals that we have never seen before. So post-natural is a dystopian story. The, corpus the corpuscle is a sustainable and self-sufficient. In post-natural, the corpuscle grows over wounds, but also over water. This corpuscle is a station for a new human being. Welcome to the post-natural world, and thank you. And I'm listening you to your feedbacks now. <laughs> Hi, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. I Thank think you. that like you're exactly like one of the one team lady that is doing such an amazing work and especially like just thinking that like again, like you came in without like any 3D design, you know, like knowledge that like that's just mind blowing. So definitely kudos on, you know, the hard work and persistence and, you know, like just on the level of presentation and the thinking about like every aspect of the design. Uh, so, you know, like I commend you on all that and I think that that's, uh, you know, like beautiful and I think that it has like so much potential like on to like moving into next chapters and uh, really like, uh, you know, um, enhancing this idea. I would like to see like even more like of the artifacts, to be honest, like selfishly, because like that's how we started a lot of like the concepting of uh, this project. And I think that there is room for that, like so you know, like to have this story told. And I think that throughout, you know, like different chapters, like I think that it's going to be like beautiful to keep enhancing, you know, like this uh, idea and uh, this like part of the story. Um, so yeah, thank you so much uh, for the hard work. It uh, really like shows how much, uh, uh, you know, like the work you put in and how elevated it is. Thank you, Pavlina. <laughs> Yeah, congratulations on the tremendous progress that you made in the in the past uh, weeks. I can see you learned a lot new tools and you managed to implement them. And I can tell we have some affinity to jewelry design, I would say, especially those artifacts you did look a lot like uh, jewelry. And also yeah, I can see that aesthetics in the in the corpus so, as well. And obviously you have a really nice uh, sense of uh, visual style and presenting your work. So that brings a lot to the project. So. Thank you, Radul. And I try to use Grasshopper. <laughs> I try. There, there is time. This is such a nightmare. <laughs> uh, next, next chapter, next chapter, there will be some grasshopper. A lot grasshopper. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> That's where uh, if you if you manage to escape grasshopper this time around, next one it's like you know the goal. <laughs> Did, I did, know. Did, I you, know. did you buy the book already? Brody? Yes, I bought the book. <laughs> I started to read it, but I don't understand the thing. <laughs> Uh, so I think like for me, the the thing, um, I mean, I, I obviously commend you for, for the work. I think like the visuals are beautiful. Uh, Thank you. I think like in general, it's very well presented. I, but for me, like the, the highlight, I think like, you know, having worked together for a couple of weeks is your attitude and, you know, having, having always a smile. I think that's very important. Like, uh, you know, there's always a struggle. Uh, deadlines as per seen every day and then you never lose the smile so i think that's very commendable as well i think uh, you know like you should keep the attitude and you're gonna have fun you're gonna enjoy the journey 
and then you know like I couldn't I couldn't tell that uh, you never had a 3D modeling 3D modeling experience before, so you should be very proud as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, I, I am amazed as well, like in only three three months to be able mm. to design this yeah, this yeah. kind of thing. So I hope I will be able to to design with Grasshopper. So you never saw me crying, but I cried in front of Grasshopper, but not <laughs> in tears. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, it was it was really fun. Like yes, it was really fun. I had so yeah. much fun this past you, few weeks. You should, you should. That's the main <laughs> idea. Thank you. Super fun, Bernie. It's always a pleasure to watch your work. <laughs> you really have so much fun in the process. Yes, yes. And it's a great push, and the final execution is so nice. It's really so presented well, the visuals and everything just makes it up the entire story is so nice. Yeah, I mean, this is one of my favorite visuals. It's just like I, I remember Michael just getting confused. Oh, that, that, that you have done this in a day <laughs> because uh, this was something that you produced like overnight, which is like such a uh, great visual. Yeah, and actually like the last um, week with uh, the Media Lab, when we design with Photoshop and all, and uh, I was like thinking about amalgamation this time. I was like, oh, I'm going to struggle so much for the next chapter. <laughs> but, but I had fun for a week, but I know for the, the next month is going to be so hard. <laughs> but yes, yes, I, I had so much fun during this chapter, so I hope it's going to be the same. It really shows in your progress. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Really, like such a you know incredible uh, work. Uh, really, so much growth, like on so many levels. Uh, very excited to to see the, all this like coming together. Thank you, like guys, really, like for you know like uh, pushing the work and you know like uh, a big thank you to all the team. Really, this is a team effort, right? Like uh, everyone like helping each other, being there for each other with different like, capacities, and um, you know like I just like I can't wait like to see like the next steps for you guys. But um, what I just want to say, it's like one part definitely, you know, is the technical part and execution and design, right? Like that's uh why we're here but the other part is like really like how much you've grown but like in this like three months um you know like closing chapter two on also the level of teamwork of like uh, you know like understanding each other helping each other out like being there uh, for each other as a you know like as a bigger like extended team and uh, this is like really wonderful to see uh, this is not an easy task, especially since like uh, all of you are coming from, you know, like different corners of the world. You have different traditions, different mindsets, different cultures, right? Like, so it's totally understandable and it's commendable that like you guys like are actually, you know, like working together so well uh, while being challenged, right? To, to learn so many new tools, so many new techniques and, uh, you know, like trusting and being vulnerable and uh, giving so much uh, trust into like uh, all the educators and the program. So I just, you know, like want to say like one big congratulations before <laughs> we enter like a holiday season for a couple of weeks and uh, you can, you know, like relax and uh, have some nice time and family time. But uh, definitely great, great, uh, you know, like uh, I can say that with great pride that I'm proud of, uh, you know, like each and one of you, like on how much like really like you've accomplished, not only as designers, but again, as uh, you know, like as humans, right? Like and how much you're growing. So it's really the, the greatest pleasure, to be honest, like to to be part of this program for me. Thank you, guys. All the best. And Thank happy you. holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> See you in chapter Thank three, you. guys. Congratulations. We will we'll start with a game in chapter three. Oh, <laughs> giving games. away some cool stuff. Yeah, I just, uh, just want to lay down some, <laughs> some interesting stuff. Yes. Just well, saying the important yeah. stuff. Yes. Thank you, guys. See you next year, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, guys. Finally. Thank you.